I guess um so uh yeah um i got my microphone working so at least you can hear me and even though i'm way too close and i don't know what to do <sighs> let's do real okay is this oh i'm like <sighs> bloody hell okay how do i look oh i i can't hear anyone because i where's janet you're fine you're, you're doing okay you look good now okay you're good now so oh. On okay. with the show. Okay, on with the show. Um, let's see where to begin. Um, today we have um, Booker Amole from the Communist Party of Kenya here to talk to us about uh, to talk to us about uh, about. Um, the historical and dialectical materialism. So what we realize is that Westerners really lack, although this like camera makes it look like I have plaque or something shiny, like like I'm wearing a, what do you call it? Those, um, what do you call those braces? Veneers. Uh, You're not wearing veneers. It's just the weird lighting. Okay. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> I know it makes it look like that and I don't know what to say. Okay. Um, I forgot what I was talking about. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So most Westerners completely lack the skill of dialectical and historical materialism. And I love Lenin in that I love his imperial uh, materialism and his imperial critici criticism where he takes Bazarov, Bogdanov, and, and uh, Plekhanov even to task about their lack of dialectical materialism. But unfortunately, Lenin's not the best person for somebody who's like all lost, like, well, I don't know what dialectical materialism is, that kind of person. Um, but thank God we have Stalin for that. He wrote an entire book called Dialectical and Historical Materialism. And even better than that, we have Booker Omole, who has deeply studied this, like he knows it without even reading, like he's just um, fantastic. Like he explains it, it like, I, I don't know if this is, I'm allowed to say this, but he actually explains it better than Stalin does. <laughs> so watch that. And then I read half of dialectical and historical materialism. It, I was a lifetime smoker, so. <laughs> I did quit. And you, you know why I quit? I quit because I read that Lenin would exile smokers. And then um, I thought about it for a while and I'm like, I don't want to be the type of person that will be exiled, that Lenin would exile to the chimney. So that's why I quit smoking. Seriously. Um, anyways. <sighs> Uh, oh yeah, um, but before we begin, since it's almost Valentine's Day, uh, I want to read this um, piece from Stalin, um, in, uh, instead of like, or today, um, instead of Nadezhda remembers, I'm going to write, actually, let me start with reading this piece from Stalin. It is like so adorable, because, um, this is on February 15th, 1905, Valen 
and he's talking about what happened on February 14th. Um, and he organized, okay, in response to the czar's like anti-Semitism, Stalin created a rally of love. Um, so I'm going to read about this right now. To the citizens, long live the red flag. Great hopes and disappointment. Instead of national enmity, mutual love and confidence. And instead of a fratricidal pogrom, a huge demonstration against Tsarism, the culprit of the pogroms. The hopes of the Tsarist government have been collapsed. The attempt to incite the different, incite the different nationalities in Tiflis against one another has failed. The Tsarist government has long been trying to incite the proletarians against one another has been trying to break up the general proletarian movement. And that is why the organized pogroms in Gamal, Kishnev, and other places. It provoked a fraternal frat recital war in Baku with the same object. At last, the gaze of the Tsarist government rested on Tiflis. Here in the middle of the Caucasus, intended to enact a bloody tragedy and then to carry it to the provinces. No small matter to incite the nationalities of the Caucasus against one other, another and to drown the Caucasian, by, by Caucasian he means people from the Caucasus Mountains, of course, proletariat in its own blood. The Tsarist government rubbed its hands with glee. It even distributed a leaflet calling for a massacre of Armenians. It had hoped for success. But suddenly, on February 13th, as if despite the Tsarist government, a crowd numbering many thousands of Armenians, Georgians, Tatars, and Russians assemble in the enclosure of the Vank Cathedral and take a vow of mutual support in the struggle against the devil who is still sowing strife again among us. Complete unanimity. Speeches are delivered calling for unity. The masses applaud the speakers. Our leaflets are distributed, 3,000 copies. The masses eagerly take them. The temper of the masses rises. In defiance of the government, they decide to assemble the next day in the enclosure of the same cathedral in order to once again vow to love one another. Valentine's Day. The enti entire cathedral enclosure and the adjacent streets are packed with people our leaflets are distributed and read quite openly. The, cloud, the crowd split up into groups and discuss the contents of the leaflets. Speeches are delivered. The temper of the masses rises and they decide to march in demonstration past the Zion Cathedral to the mosque to vow to love one another, to halt at the Persian cemetery to take another vow, vow once again and then disperse. The ma masses put their decision into the into execution. On the way near the mosque and in the Persian cemetery, speeches are delivered and our leaflets are distributed. Twelve thousand. The temper of the masses rises higher and higher. Pent up revolutionary energy breaks to the surface. The masses decide to march through the Palace Street and Go Golovinsky Prospect, only then to disperse. Our committee takes advantage of the situation and immediately organizes a small leading corps. This corps, headed by an advanced worker, takes a central provision and an improvised red flag flutters right in front of the palace. The banner barrier carried shoulder high by the demonstrators and delivers an emphatically political speech in which he first asked the comrade not to be dismayed by the absence of a social democratic appeal on the flag. No, no, answered the demonstrators. It is inscribed in our hearts. And then he goes on to explain the significance of the red flag, which is the people's flag is the deepest red because of all the murdered dead. Okay. Criticizes the preceding speakers from the social democratic viewpoint and exposes the half-heartedness of their speeches urges the necessity of abolishing czardom and capitalism and calls among the demonstrators to fight under the red flag of the social democracy. 
Wrong li long live the red flag, the masses shout in response. The demonstrators then proceed towards the Vank Cathedral. On the way, they halt three times to listen to the banner bearer. Then again, the latter calls upon the demonstrators to fight against Tsarism and urges them to vow to rise in revolt as unanimously as demonstrated. We swear, the masses shout in response. The demonstrator reached the Vank Cathedral after a minor skirmish with the Cossacks and the Cossacks disperse. Such was the demonstration of 8,000 Tiflis citizens. In the face of the citizens of Tif Tiflis retaliated to the hypocritical policy of the Tsarist government. That is how they took revenge for the blood of the citizens of Baku. Glory and honor to the citizens of, of Tiflis. In the face of thousands, the citizens assembled with the red flag and they called off the pogroms. But you, you cheer, okay, first of all, to overthrow the czarist autocracy. You want uh, to abolish all national enmity, do you not? And the and for this, and you are striving for the solidarity of peoples, are you not? Know them, citizens. All the national stripes will stripes will be abolished only when inequality and capitalism will uh, will be abolished. And so, basically, um, long live the people. And they once again, um, yeah, they once again, right before they disperse from the Van Cathedral, they vow to love one another forever. So, and it's, so you know, whenever somebody compares, tries to do a Hitler versus Stalin comparison, this is what I always do. Like, I'm like, Hitler organized a hate rally in Kristallnacht. Stalin organized a rally of love on Valentine's Day. <laughs> so with that, um, I hope you guys' um, hearts are beating. And we all should take a vow to love one another forever because that's a good vow to take the world proletariat. And I love you guys, each and every one of you, I hope. Anyways, with that... Uh, Let's watch Booker Amole. You're going to be impressed by him. And then I will read some Stalin. Today we have Booker Ingesa from Kenya. He is running to be a member of the parliament from the Communist Party. Did I get that right? Yes, and uh, I am the national vice chairperson of the Communist Kenya, of the Communist Party of Kenya. Okay, well, um, yeah, I'm part of the CPUSA, so... I was very surprised um, to see news reports to see that you were you guys were doing very well. Um, and so what is causing this new energy? Um, maybe this is not uh, something unprecedented. Uh, there is a lot of organization that has uh, been going on. And um, it's not the first time in the history of our struggle that communists are involved. In fact, uh, Esha, if I could tell you, is that uh, the Communist Party of Kenya is only advancing a struggle that has been going on since uh, what we call the sham independence. And for a long time, um, we have been operating as communist underground or uh, what we call covertly it's only after the 2010 constitution that uh, the Communist Party of Kenya uh, got that legal bearing to be registrable within the Kenyan, within the Kenyan um, you know, territory and operate overtly and even to participate in the election. Okay. It will so interest you. you. Oh, sorry, go on. I'm saying it will interest you to know that before we called ourselves the Communist Party of Kenya, we used to operate at least legally within the Social Democratic Party of Kenya. So, uh, so we were never reformists. We were not uh, social democrats. That that was you, the only well, way. Well, we Lenin called himself the Russian. I mean, the Bolsheviks called themselves the Russian Social Democratic Party and Labour Party. <laughs> 
Um, the, our historical moments are quite different. Uh, of course. Um, so you talk about the sham independence. Is that the one from Britain or like what is the sham independence? When I talk about sham independence, is that um, uh, in 1963, when we receive our independence, uh, we did not fight it to the logical conclusion because um, uh, after the Imperial Britain realized that they were losing the war against um, the land defense force that is popularly known as the Mau Mau, mm -hmm. they decided to negotiate the mm -hmm. independence. And uh, that came to the Manchester Constitution. But the realities is, of the wait, 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 hold on. So, so basically, the Manchester Constitution was a constitution that was negotiated with Britain and not written 100% by Kenyans. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, okay. So, what did it say or what did it contain that was um, anti sovereign? Maybe if I could give you a brief history about it, it Please. will help uh, understand because the Manchester Constitution was really a neo-colonial constitution. And um, in the struggle for independence, there were two stratas of the people that were fighting for independence. There were the privileged nationalists that actually owned land. So they were much uh, ready to negotiate with the colonial Britain because to them, they saw the privileged positions that were held by the white minority rule at that time, and they admired them. So the nationalists, especially on the reactionary side, were only looking forward to sit on the same positions of privileges, and they did not have the struggle of land. But there was also another faction that was being led by the field marshal, Dedan Kimathi, who we call our father and our hero of independence, he was leading the peasants and the landlords, and he was leading an armed struggle. And to them, liberation means land. And they wanted, uh, it was a fight for land, and they were not going to negotiate with the Imperial Britain because um, if they negotiate with them, then they will not have land. So you either give us land and you leave our country. But the nationalists but that were being led by the founding father, I don't like to call him the founding father because um, <laughs> it was a sellout. Uh, that's Jomo Kenyatta negotiated out an independence to restore and to protect the right to land by the, colon the colonial forces. And also, uh, um, you know, people make a joke about it, but it is true that they even gave him a wife in return to, <laughs> you know, protect the colonial Britain to have land in our country. So in that so way, in that way, you realize that the real progressives that were fighting for independence were actually killed before the sham independence. So Dedan Kimati was hanged in prison and the peasants lost their, you know, their iconic leader. And then the British now started to divide the national liberation forces between the people who were able to negotiate that were led by Jomo Kenyatta and the people who were not willing to negotiate that were led by Jaramo Kyokinga Odinga at that time. So that ended up to a neo-colonial constitution called the Manchester Constitution, which was not really uh, about sovereignty, but protecting certain British interests. Oh, okay, that's typical. I mean, they did do that all over the world, like India, Pakistan, Iran, like, like um, and so, um, so I guess um, under the Manchester Constitution, um, what was I know it's a let me let me try to ask the question properly. Under the Manchester Constitution. Was there like was Kenya forced to take out an IMF loan? Was there austerity? Was there certain privatization measures? Uh, the Manchester Constitution's main interest was to align the Kenyan economy to be part of the colonial economy. That means 
to be an appendage of the British uh, economic system. Basically to suck out raw material and for, for, cheap, for cheap, right? Yes. Uh, first of all, it was issue of land that the people, the white people that owned land, the white minority, mm-hmm. uh, if they were to leave, then the Kenyan people got to compensate them for that land that they took for free. Oh my you know, God. So they, uh, so they actually got paid for it to leave. The second um, condition was that the people who had remained in the country had right to those tracts of land. And um, there was, um, you know, n- no way in which the, the land will be returned to the tillers or the people who needed the land most at that time. Um, it was also to preserve the British foreign interest in our countries in terms of extractive uh, sector and not just extractive se- sector. Kenya was uh, a very strategic, um, you know, supplier of uh, cash crops to Britain. You know, they turned our economy upside down. Oh so, yeah, they do that. I'm, I mean, the, 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 they do that. Like they turn every. I actually wrote an article about this called "Ghosts of Colonial Past." I'll send it to you after. But I mentioned how they turned India into a tea plantation, and then they turned Indonesia into a jute plantation, and maybe the British did, the Dutch did, but it doesn't even matter. But like, yeah. And then Jamaica became like a sugar uh, plantation. So yeah, they turned every colony into like a fat farm factory, right? Yes. The, the idea was to make Kenya a chief exporter of raw materials and to mm-hmm. derail the country from pursuing industrialization process and in return also open the Kenya for a market mainly of substandard and secondhand goods. And in that way, then we, we will remain, uh, you know, uh, continuously Over. colonized. And, and, and also... Oh, go, uh, yeah. I said uh, continuously, but that's how they also continuously, like, keep people very poor and, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yes, because, uh, and, and even there was military arrangement because um, uh, after the independence, the negotiation of independence, the British uh, soldiers remained on our land. Wow. And, um, and, and, and what was the purpose of the, 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 the now we, the unpopular British soldiers, uh, we call them Batuk here Batuk. in Kenya. That sounds like a bad word in Hindi, so uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they occupy the Nanyuki side, but the main they, they were retained here for mainly two interests. One of them was to protect the British foreign interest and British multinationals in our country. Mm-hmm. And the second one is that there were still remnants of um, after the hanging of Dead and Kimati, there were still remnants of radicals that were organizing in the forest. And the founding father at that time, John, feared that he could be overthrown. <laughs> so the British soldiers were to also protect him from being kicked out. From protecting him didn't... from democracy, essentially. <laughs> the yes. will of the people. Um, so how, okay, so what was the struggle that led to the 2010 constitution? We've had, uh, uh, we, we, we call it here in Kenya, we have the first, second, and now we're talking about the third liberation. Okay, so talk about the second liberation first. Now, when we talk about the second liberation, after we had uh, a dictator in our country that dominated us for 27 years uh, with the support of the United States of America's of government and um, our former uh, you know, colonizer, the Britain. <laughs> Not that they're and, like they're always. Tr- have you noticed that they're always together? Like we have a joke that Janet and I call it. We call it. We call this alliance the fracas alliance, or there's a less pleasant sounding word. It's F U K U S France U K U S alliance. Oh uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, so, up they, for people. They, so they were able to prop uh, Moi dictatorship 
the late, uh, you know, dead dictator now. We hope we can try him posthumously. That is the dictator moment. Uh, for 27 years. But after the, the success of removing Moi from power, the second liberation was about constitutional change mm -hmm. because um, there is only one part that um, we changed in the colonial Manchester constitution. Uh, of course, there were several amendments, but the most profound one was the one for introducing multi-party democracy in our country. Uh, before there wasn't? There wasn't. Uh, it was one party state led by Kanu at that time, which okay. was um, led by Moi. Okay, so it was literally a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, it is um, most literal fact, uh, we, could, we could even say that the national bourgeoisie were too weak, you know, to oppress their own people. So they had to form <laughs> alliances of oppression, uh, you know, with the uh, with their, their, the countries of the metropole to try and, uh, you know, uh, uh, drive their exploitation and oppression of the local people. But then after that, people realized that, uh, no, it is not just about dictator now. It is about the colonial constitution. Because at that time, even the communists could not do overt work because there were anti, you know, seditious laws that uh, will have you exiled and in prison just because you are reading... Uh, uh, the manifesto of the communist party or something wow. like that so uh, uh, the infamous uh, nyayo torture chambers were known for uh, you know trying to extract and torture progressives to try and tell informations about the underground cells that were organizing at that time so the second liberation was about constitutional change and um, it started off in 2002 and um, only was realized eight years later. Oh, and many comrades mat matired in the streets, you know, defending, um, you know, the right to change the constitution, the right to constitutional amendment. There were very high profile, you know, assassinations of the government at that time to, um, to try and derail that constitutional process. But it brought new life uh, to our country. In fact, now we say it is the most progressive constitution in, you know, the continent. Oh, because okay, even so if we, yeah. Go ahead. Can you tell us like some of the rights? Because um, Americans definitely need a new constitution and they could learn. So what are some of the rights in the Kenyan uh, 2010 constitution that you're, that makes it progressive? Yeah, for example, the right to the social rights are the constitution is very strong on social rights and social justice. Mm -hmm. That each and every Kenya has a right to housing, even though the state, wow. you know, does not, you know, want to look at that because they say they are not ready yet to implement that part of the constitution. Lie. <laughs> um, there, is, there is right to, you know, quality health care. There is right to dignified employment. So um, all the social rights and even the human rights section, um, uh, we used to have uh, uh, the school police squads that uh, could kill people and uh, in poor neighborhoods and nothing will be done. Now, at least they will still do it, but they know that um, they will be held personally responsible uh, you know, within the constitution. So that way we find um, the land issue. Now it's about interpretation, but the land, the land issue is still also very, remember the British uh, multinationals and British um, uh, citizens that uh, had robbed the land here for free mm -hmm. were given land for 999 years. Mm -hmm. So now the constitution reduced that leasehold to 99 and even for 50, and they say land is for use. So basically the land, uh, uh, the land act is also very progressive. So Indeed, what happens, then, so, so if they're not using it, you can take it? Uh, now they're interpreting the constitution, the land section a very, in a very capitalist manner, because uh, in a, the in a very what manner? manner? Capitalist manner, in a very capitalist manner, because capitalist manner. Ah, yes. Okay. Um, how do judges get selected? Like uh, in Kenya, um, 
so because they're the ones who are interpreting the constitution, like uh, do they have a length of term or are they judges for life? Who selects them and how they, are they confirmed? And that is also a very progressive element of the constitution because now we have um, the what we call the commission of judges, which um, uh, which uh, sits to it is not a prerogative of the executive anymore to elect the judges, mm -hmm. and they go under a very rigorous process uh, in terms of uh, uh, passing through the parliamentary uh, committee and then the legislation arm. Um, but all these progressive elements are diluted with rights because um, if the executive or president Kenyatta today want a law to pass in the legislation, he will just call the members of parliament to a party and then try to bribe into them and tell them, you know, this is the way the country needs to go. So even though they are very progressive in terms of uh, judges, remember the Kenyan judiciary is very independent at least in the last two elections processes, they have proved to be very independent because um, unprecedentedly, the last year, uh, last election, actually, we had the presidential candidate being nullified, uh, the election victory of a sitting president. Uh, being why nullified was it nullified? The election of President Uru Kenyatta was nullified by the Supreme Court. Oh. And, um, and that too, too it, was, uh, it was an interesting turn of events, especially from Africa. So, um, and then we had to, we had to go for a, another election because um, the Supreme Court declared the election null and void. It was full of um, corruption and uh, inadequacies in processes, and it could not meet the threshold of being called a free, fair and open election. So those are some of the elements within the 2010 constitution. And of course, for the Communist Party of Kenya, without it, we will not exist. We will be still be organizing, um, you know, covertly. So uh, it gave a new uh, life to us organizing in a more open ground. Okay. Um, also, okay, can I... Um... Oh, I just recently saw a news that there's like a really new, nice uh, train from uh, Nairobi to Mombasa. Um, and can you talk a little bit about that? And I guess uh, a lot of Americans have a lot of weird anti-China sentiments. So uh, can you talk a little bit about the train line and how that like actually improves like a uh, uh, how that helps uh i mean the british didn't had, had was just there was one highway right um i think the 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 majority of the masses in the countries of the north are you know dangerously conditioned by the propaganda that is being manufactured oh, yes by the corporate media they are dangerously Especially. conditioned that's a very well said like I, I, okay we're gonna have to cut borrow that because yes they are dangerously conditioned thank you for that ta -ta -ta, okay right, so they even today if bbc or cnn will air something that Buka is a zombie and they'll bring a <laughs> analyze you you can be sure how many uh, people will believe uh, that kind of lie so the 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 issue i'm trying to put across that the globe is being ruled by capitalist propaganda and it's a case of you know if you want to kill your dog at home you start giving him all sorts of bad names you know mm -hmm. this dog does this. but you already made up your mind you will kill the dog either way so mm -hmm. you try to build a case for it but having said that, um, uh, Asia, what I would like to say that we can criticize China, but not from the cynical and racist lenses mm -hmm. that uh, the imperialist countries would like us to do it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, the position of the Communist Party of Kenya is that the world is safe in, the, in a metropolar world than a unipolar world that yes. is being dominated by you know, an empire that is um, 
dreaming this, every can, time of uh, being ruled by war mongers, you know. Exactly. Uh, I mean, America, we, I can't remember when the last time we were not at war. And in order to have such a war mongering uh, country, like, they have to completely change the educational system and then they have to uh yeah dangerously condition the population to respond like pavlov's dogs to every call of war with fear so you're absolutely right um do you have any so advice the, so the china issue i i think we must um, look at it that china has given a new alternative for the countries of the south mm -hmm. in fact for our anti-imperialist struggles, China is the beacon of uh, our anti-imperialist struggle. In fact, um, we have seen them giving hope, uh, you know, to countries that are suffering from American sanctions and financial blockades. So uh, to call China an imperialist country is rather reactionary for those people who want to do it, because China is not arming local population to overthrow government. In fact, the, in fact, the Chinese uh, government has a, a policy of non-interference. The Communist Party would like them to interfere progressively, but they, even <laughs> though they will not, because uh, you know they respect their policy of non-interference. So, in in many ways, they are also um, uh, dangerous. I will say so. NGOs in in Kenya and in Africa that are uh, earning money and uh, you know laundering american taxpayers money the biggest victim is usaid to USAID. try and, uh, yes they yes, are yes. a united states are, are you talking about united states agency for international development and you're saying they're creating ngos yes they're creating ngos to try and turn people's thinking and uh, to condition the masses here and uh, to well, bribe uh, you know they're they're giving out money to try and sponsor you know silly programs in the in the in the you know in in with an excuse that they are um, pro development you know but in actual sense they are here to strengthen american hedge money ah uh, um, okay and um well I, I, I've also interviewed somebody else who lives in Thailand, who uh, Brian Bertelic. He talks about the same issue about the NGOs in Thailand that, like, I don't know, create random protests and just uh, disorder. Uh, like, and then there, like there was this one NGO in Myanmar where they basically tried to remove this. Um, Tried to, they tried to remove this like dam out of fake environmental concerns. So is it the same kind of thing or what are these NGOs trying to do in Kenya? Uh, I think it was uh, uh, what they call uh, inactive war or what they call soft power. That mm -hmm. one way to dominate people is first of all, is try to check them out of reality. For mm -hmm. example, there are NGOs in my country that are talking about people getting out of poverty through free enterprising. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> That's uh, not ever that happening. You, <laughs> that Go you ahead. can start your small business and you start selling apples and mangoes and within a, <laughs> a short time, you can be a big exporter of mango yeah, businesses. They try and bring certain um, success stories. Of course, most of them are fake. Mm -hmm. In the sense that they, they take people from the poor neighborhoods, bring oh. them into the national TV and tell them this person succeeded and he managed to get himself out of poverty by being a chess player. So you try and find something and work hard in that way. Oh, wow. Secondly, uh, uh, the National uh, Endowment for Democracy spends a lot of, oh my God, it's like over a few million. Okay, in Kenya. Go ahead. Secondly, what's the second? Go ahead. Sorry. And also to infiltrate culture and music and art. Mm -hmm. You know, when you capture the art and music of people and make them, you know, try to spread culture of consumerism, mm -hmm. culture pop culture, or the you know uh, anti-progressive, and to try to make people hate themselves in a very mm -hmm. derogative. Uh, that is how you manage to dominate a people. So uh, we have uh, a lot of cultural centers here 
that are looking for talents to make them superstars, you know, to mm-hmm. make them uh, Hollywood stars and to try and blow that out of proportion that indeed um, you can succeed as an individual. And it was a question of what? Less, they call it less state, more business. And, ah. um, oh, oh, and uh, uh, oh, I have one more question. Yeah. Other parts of Africa have trouble with these extremely extreme uh, Christian extremist uh, NGOs that the U.S. started. Do you have the same problem with Ken- in Kenya with the extreme Christian or Christian extremist NGOs? Yes. In fact, in most of the slum areas, we call it here, or poor neighborhoods, you will find many evangelical, extreme uh, evangelical and fundamentalist Christian organizations. But where they have done more damage is in the area of university education. Where university? The education. Mm-hmm. You will find uh, there are some extreme uh, right-wing uh, organizations, mainly from the United States and uh, Pentecostal churches that are, have invested in um, education and universities. And they are using um, uh, those centers to take people out of reality. In fact, their philosophy, their philosophy department are teaching people idealism and metaphysics as the only philosophy. And oh trying my to God. Use, yeah, they don't try to use philosophy to justify theology. So in, in, in that way, we see they are determined to colonize people through capturing the education system. Oh, okay. In this case, uh, I've got the perfect Lenin piece um, uh, or uh, Janet. Janet, can, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm sorry. I'm muted. <laughs> Maybe we can um, actually do the Stalin one with dialectical and historical materialism. Okay. Um... Okay. So, okay. So, uh, per, th- actually, that's I'm so glad because I've been trying to look for somebody who can help explain what idealism versus materialism is. And you mentioned it. So I'm like, wow, I'm excited. So, um, well, it, it's like a like this program is like a two parter. So we have an interview part and then we have a theory part. And I am so glad you mentioned the metaphysics. And, so um, what exactly is idealism and metaphysics? You know, uh, first of all, uh, there are two hostile branches of philosophy that continue to dominate the world. Mm-hmm. One, and, um, one is on metaphysics and mm-hmm. other shades of idealism, because metaphysics itself is also idealism. Mm-hmm. And the other side where we are firmly is in the side of materialism, and mm-hmm. particularly dialectical and historical materialism. So in any idea of the world, there are people who, who want to say that there is primacy of ideas over the material world. And that is what actually helps us to understand, because uh, they want to say that the ideas came before the material world. So it is not your mouth that spoke the words. It is your word first and then the mouth. So they are turning the reality upside down. Ah. And, um, and the idealist um, uh, is actually the philosophy that is used to justify the backward ideas of uh, theology and um, trying to create um, a, you know, an illusion around the people that uh, there are things like wisdom that drop from, you know, above and um, uh, there are ideas that are inert in our heads. So uh, they, they, they look at the primacy of um, ideas over our material world. And that is very an unscientific way to look at the world. And if you look at the document you have referred to, which is uh, dialectical and historical materialism, and that was um, a summarized document by Stalin, it clearly uh, you know, states that um, metaphysics on one side is um, a hostile uh, you know, philosophy in the sense that it helps to take people out of reality 
and it tries to justify the Christian thought or the religious thought that um, you know things come like a straight jacket. There are things that, like our God, they are never changing. They are the same today, tomorrow, and every day. While in reality, things are changing and are being affected and affecting themselves in um, you know in a very profound way. So, if you you go to even deeper metaphysics, I think um, metaphysics. Um, or started off by uh, in the classics by by Plato, and Plato was um, you know an idealist, and then later on it was advanced during the dictatorship of the church, which uh, we call it in Europe the dark the one thousand years of the dark <laughs> period. Yeah, and and you know during the one thousand years of the dark era, they are and the you know the. The, the, dictatorship, the dictatorship of the Roman Catholic Church was against any scientific um, development. And philosophy was placed at the service of theology. And um, we have, um, they call them thinkers, but I don't want to call them thinkers. People like Thomas Aquinas that were actually advancing philosophy to try and, um, you know, uh, maintain the hegemony of the dictatorship of the church at that time. And they misinterpreted several classic texts from the, uh, the classical philosophers of antiquity, mainly uh, Plato, Socrates, and um, of course, Aristotle, to try and justify their theology at that time. So we could see that, um, uh, of course, um, Aquinas came up with those ways to try and prove the existence of God in, in trying to delve into metaphysics and try to tell us that, you know, since if we say that in scientific terms that um, um, things are always in motion, there must have been something that put things in motion. And he said the concept of unmoved mover. And he said that could be God. But that could not be a direct uh, evidence uh, of, um, you know, the existence of God. So what I'm trying to say is that in idealist side, where there is primacy of ideas, they try to, uh, you know, justify certain abstract notions and um, uh, like uh, God, soul and all that kind of thing. And that has carried out with us now, even in the modern metaphysics, if you look at it, which the the Catholic Church is a victim of it because they have created the, what you call the Catholic social thought to mm -hmm. try and uh, influence opinion. And now they are, trying to, they are trying to explain the essence of those abstract notions through philosophy. And, and, and that debate ended in the 18th century in the modern era. So mm -hmm. uh, we cannot put philosophy at the service of theology or religion. And that is basically what metaphysics is all about. Now, when we come to materialism. Okay, go ahead. The, the materialism actually started off from um, another uh, philosopher called Feuerbach. Uh -huh. you know, and, and Feuerbach was just about he was criticizing the entire religion. In fact, the critic of religion and God, the, the notion of God actually ended in the 18th century mm -hmm. because reasonably you cannot justify it. But um, then we had um, the progress of the science of the mind that was already on a good trajectory because we had uh, uh, the ancient philosophers that were talking about allegory, and logic, but the founder of the modern logic that was used by Karl Marx to interpret in history, mm -hmm. the reality of the world was Hegelian dialectics, but mm -hmm. Hegel, uh, uh, you know, turned reality upside down because he was um, an idealist. So he built a concept around the science of the mind, which was very, uh, you know, progressive, but indeed tried to justify the absolutes you know, uh, the what, and it is, uh, uh, even the moral equation has been really been interfered with because you realize that even in metaphysics, they talk about the natural moral law and that silly things called syndesis that was given by Aquinas. And they tried to say that, you know, thou shall not steal. So 
what is the best moral question to steal to protect life when you are starving or you should not steal to respect God, you know? So in, well, in many ways. And then proper stealing is also very vague because the notion of property has changed throughout uh, every, even now. I mean, from like God, each, there's so many no notions of property that to steal is like utterly meaningless. Yeah, so if in fact, if you talk about theft, I think the people who own the means of production are the victims. So, you know, they have accumulated the product of theft in many ways through appro appropriating. You know, uh, okay. uh, Can you go back wrote. to explaining materialism? Because Americans don't understand this. So yeah. uh, <laughs> now, if, if you look at the philosophical model of materialism, which is um, mainly um, centered on deductive investigations, which is quite mm -hmm. scientific, that you start from the primacy is material. So you start from the from the known to unknown. As opposed the to from the unknown to unknown that the dialectic and that the idealists do. The idealists are, you know, they start from the effects to the causes, but we're saying, why don't we start from the material essence? For example, when we're talking about materialism, we say matter is the primacy. And mm -hmm. even if we go to the primacy of matter, then we talk about the prime matter and the mm -hmm. form, we still say the prime matter is the primacy. But in metaphysics, they say the form is the primacy because they want to justify in the essence that if the act is the primacy in terms of, um, uh, in, in, instead of just saying primacy in the real world, they come up with clever terms. So they talk about metaphysical priority, you know. And this can be seen even in, um, in human rights. You know, they, they could say that um, even though the highest um, right is to preserve humanity and, you know, and right to life, mm -hmm. then they will say you know, the right in, in the metaphysical priority, of course, is the right to, uh, to conscience and, um, and worship. That's what they say. So they try to turn issues upside down. Oh, okay. So um, when you come to... Go ahead. Sorry. Now on materialism, which... Uh, uh, we start from the material, so it is it is the brain, you know, which is the the gray matter that existed before the products of the brain, which are ideas, and it cannot be the other way around. So, in the essence, when we move from there, then we view man and let us say human beings um, as a product of nature. Mm -hmm. Which we are. And not without nature. Because in metaphysics, we are brought into nature from a bear. But we are saying that we are products of nature mm -hmm. and we are past nature in material science, in, 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 in materialism. So in effect, then materialism brings philosophy and mm -hmm. says that Philosophy is the science of reality, even though the metaphysicists want to accuse us of scientism or being a reductionist way of doing things to justify their hallucinations. But in, in, in essence, um, now let us go to what we call the hierarchy of sciences, mm -hmm. which is more important when we want to understand materialism. Okay. So the first... Uh, if we talk about the material science, which was the, the uh, you know, the first science uh, that came to be, which was physics, because mm -hmm. metaphysics just beyond the physical sciences, mm -hmm. something that is beyond the natural world. Then you can ask the metaphysics, how did you know beyond the natural world, which while we have not even known, you know, natural world in its completeness, mm -hmm. but they will have no answers for it. So, the hierarchy of sciences, then we move from physics, which deals with um, inanimate, you mm -hmm. know. Then from there, we go to uh, chemistry and then mm -hmm. biology, and then we go to human sciences. In Marxism, his interest was to use the knowledge from other sciences, which was in physics, in chemistry, in biology, 
in astro in astronomy, um, uh, you know, and try to uh, then develop uh, the to study the progress of human sciences in history. Mm -hmm. But that has already been done by sociology. So yeah, that's why we say Marx was a sociologist as well, in, mm -hmm. in essence. So how then do we understand the, from a material essence, the, the progress of humanity? So the metaphysics people states that we have to receive uh, some revelations from mm -hmm. above to try and understand. And um, you don't even have a way to verify those revelations because they come like thunder. They come with respective. You don't know who, who revealed what. And if you challenge them, they get angry at you because they are not ready to debate about issues. Yes. But now we are saying that to understand the progress of humanity, we have to then study each epoch. And we are saying that for every man and woman, the first thing that they must sustain is that they have to get basic commodities like food, mm -hmm. shelter, and only that, that he can go to the next level producing other human beings to yeah. produce the first institution, which is a family. You know, so that is why we say that economy is the substructure. Without it, all other relations cannot emanate, whether it is family, whether it is politics, because man has to sustain his basic needs. And that means whether that society is slave, slavery or neocolonial or colonial or even imperialist or socialist, the first basic element of that society must produce the material, uh, you know, basic to sustain the life of mankind. So we are saying that is the substructures. Now, all other relations then emanates from that economic arrangement. So in the view, yeah. Now, if you tell me that it is not the economy, but it is the political element, then you're trying to tell me that man became political before feeding himself. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Okay. That is ridiculous, you know. So when we are going to now materialism is that we are we are we we we, we are creating the material life first, and then from there all other relations emanates from the economic base or the economic substructure, and then now we have to study the first social organization of man, mm -hmm. which is family. And that has been written quite a bit by Frederick Engels on the mm -hmm. origin of um, family, yeah. uh, the, the origin of private property, family, and the state. And, you know, the metaphysicists want to tell us that family was given to us uh, by, you know, by God. And mm -hmm. um, in that no, way. But family keeps changing based on each era, like a thousand years ago. We had different ideas of family and technology has rapidly changed the idea of family for now. You know what I mean? Yes, of course. But then they want to tell you, no, 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 wait a minute. Family is has not. It's, it's they look at family, you know, in metaphysics, everything is static. They come mm -hmm. like they come like a straight jacket that fits you. Once you put it on, you don't have the right to think through how things are changing. So. Um, uh, that's so when the when when the economic arrangement then takes place, then there are relationships that starts to build, which is very key to understand the trajectory of um, progress of humanity through dialectical and historical analysis. That now, what was the first family in the essence? That family that sustained itself only in nature. Mm -hmm. and then produce other human beings within nature. Mm -hmm. Where they, we had um, people, uh, you know, we had wives and husbands in common. And in that way, the relationship started. And everything else that we have progressed 
even the clothes we are putting on was to to be able to safeguard man from you know high um uh, uh, the harsh weather conditions it was never that man woke up one morning and felt ashamed looking at himself mm-hmm. and then tried to look clothes to cover his nakedness like the biblical story wants to tell us mm-hmm. so in that way then we see the relationship starting to form advice from them uh, from the base if you look at from the african trajectory mm-hmm. then we see that the 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 wealth now starts to uh, be specialized because women used to manage the granary and they used mm-hmm. to do gathering and bring them to the granary so they set guard the wealth mm-hmm. and that brings matriarchy in the sense that i own the wealth so mm-hmm. then in that way the first relationship we had in matriarchy was then that we can have as many husbands as we have because we have a social power in the granary to mm-hmm. dominate the male gender so mm-hmm. that was matriarchy but again the men were in the field they learned how to domesticate animals mm-hmm. they learned how to plant things so we can see the social power is moving from the granary where the woman was the prefect of the private property and now it is going to domestication of animals now the wealth is being counted of a number of animals you have we can see the wealth is counted from how much land you are put into production and in that way we see children now are tilling land to produce more surplus for the man and the wealth is leaving the woman to become the man and the man is saying to hell with matriarchy and making even the woman the property now in that chain including children and all other wealth and we see polygamy being born from another social relations and a, ma- a woman become the property of the man and then man starts to organize to protect himself from his own children and the wife through the clan arrangement with other men ah. so in that way we see again another clan coming within the african setup in a very profound way from economic domination where children and wives are now slaves of the man because the man has material value mm. and we see man is trying to form a rudimentary government with his fellow men to try and protect themselves from the majority which are women and children in that mm. case So we are seeing social relations are taking place and governments are starting to form in a very preliminary setter so in that way then we see the interruption of that development in the african setter by the arrival of the colonial people when the colonial people arrive african people did not have the slave they, they did not have the police they did not have an organized government everything else was run by the clan and within that clan um, you know the attacks the intertribal attacks was meant to just pro, you know to expand territory and do that kind of thing but the colonial government now come and start to interfere with that development that still emanates from the economic base because every time the metaphysicist approaches they want to say that we have reduced the whole concept of man to the material and economic and we have forgotten the moral element of it but they do not know that even the moral constructions are taking place between the economic relations that emanate from the production forces so in that way we see our reality reflects in a very historical and cyclic manner and that is why then we are saying that what karl marx did was to put you know dialecticals the thinking of hegel and then bring in materialism of feuerbach and put it in history to come up with a coherent science of liberation of the proletariat which the in 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 african concept we say is the science of the liberation of the, uh, the the liberation of the oppressed people and that is why we don't feel we are not ashamed when the ruling class hate the science that threatens their positions of privileges because it is a hostile philosophy 
that they need to be scared. So if if they don't uptake it, then we say the Communist Party of Kenya should focus on the oppressed stratas because those are the people who will consume our ideas. But then if you come to now the colonial, uh, the development of the Kenyan state, because it is important, and I think if, if, even in the in the in the in the in the United States, if they, they, they go into history as a colony of the Britain in, in, in that sense, then they realize that the people, the, the colonizing power only had power because they subjugated the economic relations and appropriated wealth from the local people and then alienated them from the basic or the fundamental instrument of production, which was land. So then the people are subjugated because they do not have a means of living. So they are meant to work, but still depend on the people who are in charge of the distribution of the wealth they did not produce. So the colonial economy in that sense, subjugating the people and then expropriating their, their, their resources to take them to the country of the metropole. So the queen has gold, but it does not dig gold. The queen mm -hmm. has... Um, you know, has the um, diamond. Uh, <laughs> One of her diamonds is called the Star of Africa, which she got it from South from the, the colonial yeah. mines in South Africa. <laughs> so in that way, you can see that when you understand, when you master Marxism, you can see the development of history and you can postulate the the advancement of history in mankind. So after the colonial people left us you know, reluctantly because they were beaten. Mm -hmm. um, but you can see that they are careful when they're leaving. They are saying that if we tell these people that they can live of ideas, uh -huh. again, that is an element of metaphysics. You can live off ideas and not on material reality. Mm -hmm. So then we had the prosperity gospel, the missionaries that oh. are coming to tell people now we want to create for you a world outside, you know, the real world. So that if the, the more good you are to the colonizers or your government, the more respectful you are, you have a safer place in heaven. So please read the Bible and, uh, you know, respect the authority. And in that way, you will inherit the kingdom of God and you don't need to fight for basic things that are vanity in this world. But as they do that, to them, they are, uh, you know, living in abundance. They are um, uh, expropriating the local people. They are now, there is mushrooming of the churches in the continent to try and make sure that people get to be promised quite a bit. And um, I think when I was growing up, there was a very popular phrase that was used by the church that the poor, uh, you know, the poor, it's very easy for the poor people to go to heaven and the rich people, it will be like a camel passing through the that's eye what, of a needle. That's what Jesus said in the Bible, is that it is harder for a rich man. It is easier for a camel uh, to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. But I was thinking about the Desmond Tutu saying where he said, at first, um, the white man had the Bible and we had the land. But then they gave us the Bible and took the land. <laughs> That's what basically happened. So that was a very famous uh, colonial teaching that, um, you know, we want to go and inherit some mushrooms in heaven and we should not be struggling for, uh, you know, vanity and uh, things of the earth. So in that way, you've seen idealism now being a metaphysics, being used to promise a people a false hope while the ruling class continue to dominate. And then brings out the relationships, the social relationships that still emanate from the colonial economy in the sense that now we have the landowners, we have the factory owners that owns the means of production in the colonial government, and then they have an intermediary to prefect the rest of the population, which were majorly the national bourgeoisie at that time Maybe we should not call them the national bourgeoisie because they were not involved in production. We could call them comprado bourgeoisie because they were broke <laughs> yes. from the colonial system in, in a sense. So if you 
if we if we look at that, what I'm trying to put through is that when, once you study dialectical and historical materialism and understand it so deeply, then everybody else on the metaphysics turns the reality upside down in the yeah. sense that it's 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 very it's 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 very pretty obvious when you have conversations with people that come from idealistic or metaphysics uh, tradition, and and you can see how brainwashed or you know how they are product of hallucinations, and they continue to even the analysis of the economy they try uh, they 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 can turn it upside down because we are now put at the the vicious forces of the market, you know, yes. we are, uh, you know, we, and, and that is the idea of market fundamentalists, that there's nothing we can do. In fact, you remember Adam Smith telling us that Invisible when the hand. is high, then there is the common good. <laughs> uh, so you try to understand how comes when the profit is high, that means there's exploitation. But then on the other side, they're saying that the, 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 the common good, you, you cannot explain such a thing. So no, no. and uh, it's funny because um, I was looking at, okay, so I, 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 I get some random people mail me history te- books all the time. And like, these are top American universities and they're spouting out utter nonsense. Like I can't even explain. And it's like, oh my God. And that's all idealism because they've literally inverted reality. And that's the same way the U.S. CNN works with their news. They literally invert reality. Like, I, I don't know how to, but you, you explained it really well. Like, and so, um, but it, but, but they can get away with inverting reality more in, say, the inside the imperial court than they can in Kenya because real, like your material conditions, most people's material conditions are, I, I, I so it's below law they're living like in fact in in Kenya people live like um, majority of the people live like animals they don't have even the prerequisite conditions to allow them to think like human beings they are constantly living in a war zone with nothing to yeah. eat with they are spending more time thinking about their sick relatives than the, their, their own development because everything else has failed but there is um, you know, when we started off these conversations, you talked about democracy and you talk about collective will of the people, which um, there is also the concept of democracy from the metaphysical lenses and the concept of democracy from the materialist lenses. Even though we look at democracy as the collective will of the people to determine their positions, you know, on governments and the system that rules them, but this collective will must also be looked at within the social relations from the economic perspective. And that brings the concept of power in the sense. For example, the whole thing is that the most powerful man on earth is the president of the United States. But then we have to look at how did he get that power? Because when the, the, we started off the origin of democracy, then we say that the power is from the people. Remember but during the Roman <laughs> when, when we, no, no, actually, when we talk about the Roman Catholic Church dictatorship in the Europe, they talk about power is from above and they use it to justify the monarch system as the descendants of Adam and Eve. Oh, and they yeah. Were given but, okay, okay, but the power. president, the United States, they say that it is from the people, but that's a lie because James Madison, who, who wrote the Constitution, literally says, the purpose of our government is prote- is to protect those with property from those without. These are his exact words. And what you notice is that U.S. is beautiful at fulfilling that original uh, purpose, which is to protect those with property from those without. Correct. So if you're talking about the, the collective will of the people, we must also look at their material conditions to effectively then will, because there are things that we are all willing to do, but we can't do them because of our material conditions, our material material realities. For example, in the Kenyan constitution, they talk about we have freedom to own land in, in every part of the country that we can. But if you don't have money, then that freedom is devoid of you. So it's useless. 
Yeah, they have to alien basically as Len, I mean Lenin mentioned this, you have to kind of alienate the big landowners and just like take the land from them and distribute it to people like otherwise like you can't you I mean everywhere where they've tried any kind of gradual reform, it doesn't work because they don't want to give up their power and they kind of just keep the so you literally have to use your power to alienate them from their land and say, Hey, it's going, we're going to be in charge. I mean, nothing else works. So the problem that if you cannot, if you continue to appropriate or expropriate the people, then you can, you actually consolidate another source of power. This mm -hmm. power is not yours. It's from the people, but you have only alienated it from them because once you take off uh, you know, part of the surplus and keep it, then you are forming the social power, which is capital. So that that is not your power. That is that is taken from the people. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's why the, the the factory owner can say, "Oh, Booker, you know, I got power because I got money." But if you try to interrogate him, you know, where did you get land from? Then they say, "Oh, my father fought for it." Then you can probably say, "Okay, then we will fight for it because uh, you're saying he fought for it, but he he, he didn't fight for you know." 10,000 acreage of farm. But the concept of power is something that metaphysics continues to, to advance in a very upside down way, in the sense that our powers come from, you know, the, the, the will for man to be dominated by, uh, to dominate this planet. One man, you know, has been given the power from above to do the same thing, you know, to sustain the peaceful environment for each and every person of us. But on the materialism side, we are saying that if people, you know, are able to make free decisions based on the mm -hmm. product of their labor and for equitable distribution and to respect the common good, and then they will will in the sense that instead of saying that, you know, the, the proper democracy then will come that no rich person, like now you see in the United States, big lobby groups and corporates are influencing the American politics, mm -hmm. that they will not have undue advantage. Now in Kenya, if you look at it, Communist Party of Kenya is competing against what? We could say in, in, in very crude terms, it is competing against money. Because yes. if you go to do the campaigns, even though we say it's a democracy, but it's a bourgeois democracy. It's a democracy for the billionaires to elect, uh, you know, like Mark said, every so often, even if it's in five years, they try to elect somebody from the, uh, you know, from the oppressing class and uh, to dominate them. So in that way, I just wanted to also portray democracy from the metaphysics lenses and from materialism lenses. But in, in a nutshell, um, I think the future of philosophy, the future of man is anchored on dialectical and historical materialism because the future of mankind is science and not other. So even philosophy, uh, we see many philosophers can, cannot agree on what philosophy is because um, some people want to use philosophy to justify illusions. Some mm -hmm. people want to use philosophy as a science of reality. So the debate about metaphysics and um, materialism, um, at least for now, in progressive spaces, we have uh, put metaphysics to join the ox plow in the museums, but uh, they are still struggling to bring it back to the debate. Um, the danger in third world is that since education, uh, the government education, uh, is not determined by the people in government, but by foreign interests. So mm. you, 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 you will find that if you go to um, private uh, institutions or colleges or universities or government institutions, they still try to talk about metaphysics as their philosophy. Ah. And it's not a question of either or. So in that way, then people, if you have a conversation with a student of philosophy, you could say you're straightforward, stupid, because you only are talking about, you know, one way of thinking of the world. And, 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 and anything that they're talking about, like, for example, in public universities and in mostly Catholic and Christian universities, you will find that everything about Marxism and dialectical and historical materialism is actually negative. So they will yes, say they exactly here. I mean, literally in America, but yeah. Uh, so how for the third world, I guess. 
a lot of times people are, but, but there is a limit on how negative you can go because your world, what you observe is, uh, you can never say that if you work hard enough, you're going to become rich because that's never, I mean, I've been to India and I know that's not going to happen because I see it with my eyes, but, um, but I guess how do you then um, get through this level of miseducation in your context? Uh, for the Communist Party of Kenya, we have uh, an, uh, we have rolled out an elaborate program. We have an ideological school oh, in wow. the ideological school because we we have learned from the uh, from the time of independence that the colonial schooling was not going to liberate our people, and we know that the capitalist education system will not liberate uh, you know the Kenyan masses. <laughs> And the Communist Party of Kenya has started, um, you know, are continuing with an elaborate ideological um, school. Well, well, where can we learn to, about this ideological school? Um, um, we have, um, uh, I could send you a few links from our website. That would be great. But we have, a, um, we have a clear program on how to join the party. You cannot join the Communist Party of Kenya without passing through ideological training. It will be wow. impossible. And the first thing is we introduce you to the basics of um, dialectical and historical materialism. Mm -hmm. and, and the second thing is that we learn about its application and then contextualize it in our you know, national and uh, continental and international struggles. So it, it, it will take you, uh, for, for you to be a cadre in the Communist Party of Kenya, I think you will take you three, at least three years to be able to, you know, to graduate from the ideological school and start your continental and revolutionary tasks here. But oh, wow. it, is it is, it is, it is very necessary for us because um, we learn from uh, people like Amilka Cabral. You can see his portraits uh, behind me here. And then and there's Fidel have, Castro. <laughs> Yes, that's a, he's a big beacon. He inspires our I know. team period. Yeah, so then we have Samora Michelle here. And you said, Oh, I know you Samora Michelle. They, uh, in the 1970s, he was fighting against uh, Rhodesia. Yes, uh, actually, now it's uh, uh, now is Mozambique. Uh, they, and they, they, of course, at that time, uh, the Rhodesia now is called Zimbabwe. But they say that if you're building a communist party of Kenya or any communist organizations, do not give leeway to fake members who do not understand, you know, deeply how things are in terms of uh, the future of the party. So it is it will be better to spend three years to educate the people mm -hmm. because after all, they take seven years in imperialist schools being, <laughs> you know. Yeah, turning their heads upside down and they pay for it, you know. You pay for <laughs> That's a good much. point. <laughs> yeah. So if they can spend seven years being brainwashed in uh, in the departments of social sciences and imperialist, um, I call them induction rooms, then taking three years to have a master of um, of the science of reality, which is electrical and historical materialism, should be you know limited pain, especially if they are concerned about the liberation of the masses. So in, in a nutshell, what I would tell the American viewers that um, uh, it would be important to criticize things based on knowledge. Because um, sometimes when I meet um, uh, brothers and sisters from the Northern Hemisphere, they dismiss <laughs> communism without reading it. Yes. They say no, and, and, and you can see in the American education system, they have silly links like how to prevent your child from being a communist. <laughs> and, um, and to them, communism is, is, um, is bad from the start. It's just like they told us several here, that um, any goods from China are fake before they arrive. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and you know, it's just racism, uh, definitely against the Chinese people. And, and, and now 
that propaganda has been won. Now everybody in our country are looking for technology from China. They're saying we need the solar power, mm-hmm. we need the water, we need the electronic devices. They're talking about Chinese technology. Mm-hmm. And at any given time in the history of a development trajectory, there could be, um, I, I think, even if um, you look during the, when Europe was, uh, when UK actually was the production center of the world, uh, before the American technology actually developed. They were faking each and every time until they get it right. So it is not yeah. unprecedented um, that um, countries can do that. Even now in Africa, the big talk, because um, I come from an engineering background, the big talk and the big fights we had with the multinational CIS technology transfer, because we just don't want to be supplied goods. So we want a direct technology transfer from whoever is bringing that technology to the local people to build capacity, but they will never accept uh, certain a thing because it is um, they, they they look at you as um, a market, you know, not yes. as um, a direct partner that which you can focus on development issues. So uh, to rescue the masses from being conditioned by you know the live factories like BBC or CNN is to start an alternative um, uh, development of journalism and try to yes to try to have honest debates and tell people everything is uh, a subject of debate and that is debated from um, from knowledge even if you hate communism why don't you read it understand it other than being totally brainwashed and you want to run your mouth about things you don't understand which is sometimes very annoying you need <laughs> yes. to in, yes. in, so, um, so that's the, 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 the whole essence that I could encourage people that people understand communism um, and they could learn a lot of history in the United States even during the Cold War when the communists were captured um, they, they, there were certain experiments on how to get you know information from the communists but they could not succeed in any way because the, 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 the communists generally are not products that uh, they don't they don't look at um, the progress of humanity from money or perspectives like that. So you could not give them or buy them money or torture them to sell their comrades because they understand clearly that the fight they are fighting is not just about an individual struggle. In Kenya here, several communists were arrested and uh, tortured and they never talked. So people say that. Instead of them saying how the capitalists are brainwashing the masses, they'd say, ah, the communists are brainwashing. The <laughs> communists like, yes, yeah. you, 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 you see this war on terror where uh, the United States come up with all this propaganda and they start saying, ah, um, it, it, that country is a dictator. Then they start saying, now he's killing his people. We need to get in. And then the next thing is that, no, no, no. Now they are having even biological and chemical weapons. And now they're <laughs> starting a nuclear program. Now we cannot wait. They will kill the, you know. Yeah. So they're using just, they're terrifying the American population and making the other people look as bad. And then they start to give economic sanctions and financial blockades. And then they try to triangulate the population of the liberated countries by, you know, enforcing uh, hunger upon them. Because uh, once you alienate them from the, the the financial capitalist system, then they cannot trade. And then mm-hmm. you start to punish their friends, you know. And then they say, now you see people are queuing for toilet papers. We need to rescue that population from a dictator. And then they try to splash such uh, propaganda in the in the in the international media, and they hire you know the journalists here in my country look forward to such uh, live factories like CNN, and they try to oh. pick the news, and they introduce the International Journalist Award. Means how uh, the the more you badmouth the American <laughs> so-called enemies then you can get certain awards and yeah in that way they they are able to dominate the world but the most interesting thing is that this cannot continue for a long time because if you if you build something on an illusion um sometimes people ask me booker why are you fighting for communism is there any future in communism communism already lost you know you cannot 
And then I would tell them, uh, you know, it's if you are fighting on the side of truth, if you're fighting on the side of reality, those are things that can never lose. You know, they can have temporary defeats, just like communists had temporary defeats. But the future of communism is alive because during USSR, we had Moscow press in our country. We had um, Mengistu trying to spread communist propaganda here. Now they are non-existent. But the young people are now coming to the party to say, no, we are looking for... Um, we are looking for solutions. And they're saying every time there's a communist leader, they don't sell us. They, we are always, um, they, they, they are good negotiators. Even sometimes if they don't vote them, but they've got to consult them on issues. So they earn their respect because they are on the side of reality, on the side of the truth. And they are able to share their fears more honestly. So that is the future of humanity. We, we can have temporary defeats, but just like Lenin told us that there are some times in history that the events move quite, you know, yeah. quickly and they're changing every second, every hour. But there is a time in history that nothing really moves because, um, uh, you know, we are experiencing a temporary retrogression. But uh, for the progressive uh, organizations in the United States, I think there's also a lot to learn from Lenin. And oh, yes. Stalin. In, yes. in the essence. And, 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 and these lessons has helped us a lot to come up with the policies to, to lead the Communist Party of Kenya. For example, and this um, stopping deep from my heart is that most of the countries in the, uh, in the North, um, most of the organizations are victims of, of you know, revisionism. Or yes. Um, or, 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 or. Okay, the first one is revisionism, and the second one is literally not uh, not even understanding the problem. So just kind of going there like a deer with headlights. You know what I mean? Yes, and and that is a danger that any organization that is communist but are only and their memberships are only drawn from the intelligentsia, the bourgeoisie, mm -hmm. intellectuals, the the petty bourgeoisie they will always look at uh, 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 ways to preserve their positions of privileges, even if yes. they advance Marxism. Now that brings the issue of revisionism and opportunism in the essence. And that is why the Communist Party of Kenya, we have always said that we cannot allow our membership to be 70% uh, non-working class, because at least we, we are sure that them, they see the exploitation that happens in, um, you know, in the social relations in the production on a daily basis. Even though we have a, um, a still um, uh, non-backward elements within the bourgeoisie and the, and the petty bourgeoisie, that through their commitment to reading theory have advanced their thinking in many ways, but still we respect that the working class are the biggest optic of our ideology and they are able to see the reality. So if the the communist parties, the left-wing political parties in Europe or in the North America can develop such kind of policies, then um, they will be able to defeat revisionism and also perfecting their knowledge. Because um, uh, one time I think we were having a discussion in the party, how come that the revolution happened in the backward country called uh, you know, Russia at that time and when everybody later. was expecting yeah, and China later, which were mainly peasants, and in fact, China was a colonial that they were suffering yeah. against the brutal, um, the biggest brutal um, imperialist, the, the Japanese imperialism at that time. But how come the Europe uh, did not experience, um, you know, a revolution at that time? There, there were debates about uh, the Rosa Luxemburg and, his, and her comrades that were trying to revise Marxism to fit social democracy. There were debates. Uh, if you look at the first international, uh, which was uh, purely on the side of the workers, then the second international that was um, about you know imper imperialism, basically. Yes, in fact, they were supporting imperialist wars. The, and, um, the, the Westerners were yes. Yes, yeah. Then we have the third international that was being led by Comrade Lenin, and I found that inspired. Uh, uh, we call him Uncle Ho, the leader of the Vietnamese revolution, to become yes. revolutionary just because 
the national equation and the national liberation program that was clear within the Lenin's writings and um, uh, you know anti-colonial governments that brought a lot of clarity. And, and what can progressives learn from that? Because people don't just fight for ideas. They, mm -hmm. they has to, uh, because even the biggest support base that we have in our country are people that we have been able to uh, join them to fight genuine wars about issues to do with their daily lives. And they have been able to win progresses and they become loyal and faithful to the party in many ways. For example, the landless that gets land will never leave the party. So that if you get a landed or a big landlord and you're trying to talk about uh, communism, he sees you as a threat to his positions of privileges. So it's just a useless debate because his material conditions only depends on him being a parasite on the tenant, depending on him being a parasite of the people who work. So you're wasting your time trying to organize uh, those sections of people. Yeah. Uh so um yeah we're when will we see um booker's collected <laughs> works out i should try to have it through there's a lot of work to do but i should try to write a few notes to publish but what i wanted to say is that the, the, the revolution has to have a call to win certain things for the masses because look at mao's call land to the tealers so that means the tealers get the land Mm -hmm. you know, bread for the people in Vietnam. So we have to win real material issues uh, for the masses. What is yours then, in Kenya right now? For us, we are very strong in the landless uh, areas. So you are we, at Land for the People? Yes, Land for the People. Like, you know, uh, and, and then the next thing that in the trade union movement, we are saying we, we don't want just a minimum wage. We need a living wage for the people. So in that way... <laughs> And, and then we are winning uh, if we go to a collective again for any 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 trade union they will know when the communists are there there is no bribes there is no jobs it's just uh, you know real business then we are able to win the people in the peasant organization you know we have an operation drive the brokers out and um, uh, brokers are just people who come to buy farm products at almost nothing mm -hmm. and go to sell them. So we are driving up, like now where I'm doing my politics, it's uh, the uptake of my support is we are driving the brokers out. We want to build How are you driving the brokers out? The building corporate, the driving brokers out is to make sure that every small farmer joins the cooperative. Ah, the corporate. Okay, 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 got it. It's kind of like a union for peasants. Yes. So if you want to buy tomatoes, you have to go to the you have to go to the cooperative. So you cannot go there and put a truck and then like in the olden days, you put a truck and you delay the process. Mm -hmm. So as the farm products have to go back, then the prices start to drop. You buy for almost nothing and then check them to sell. So mm -hmm. in that way, if we are talking about they are there. In the, in the in the backward areas where we are organizing, we are winning, we are winning real gains for the people. The the people who are uh, uh, the the communist rappers they are they are sim they are sim they are rapping about basic issues they're not they're not rapping about uh, communism they're not rapping about direct materialism they they are mocking the imperialist the the capitalist uh, po politician who walk <laughs> around fattening themselves from the things they have stolen from the people you know. <laughs> They, they, they are singing about um, certain successes that they think Booker through the Communist Party of Kenya has been able to score in their communities. They are saying that we, they, they, they remain committed to the party because of the successes and we are willing to learn you, even within our circumstances. So the, 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 the power that helps to build the communist movement uh, from history and uh, and and uh, all over the world is that you you need to start winning things for the masses and you they will trust you in the sense that you are always in solidarity with them and also you share with them when when you are weak or you share with them your fears you share with them why you think you need to retreat a bit and then reorganize the population and go for an all-out offensive because you do not want to put 
your best soldiers, you know, as gun folders. You don't want to declare a war with no, you That's know. That's what no Lenin people. wrote in what is to be done about that, because the, their party every few months, like like it would build up and then the czarist police would go crack down on the best, uh, on them and send them all to Siberia. And that's why he kind of had the party structure that way to protect people from these massive czarist crackdowns. <laughs> yes, and we have had such adventures also in our struggles in Kenya. 1982 coup led to a big crackdown of revolutionaries, you know, and that was a reactionary coup that was being taken by certain, uh, you know, people within the lower ranking army officials and some people who call themselves revolutionaries that were actually angry to get power. They wanted, you know, we want power now. But then the, the end result is that the, 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 the whole um, underground organization that they had struggled to build for several years was crushed in under 18 months and, uh, you know, and, and the comrades were hanged in Enmas and jailed and exiled. So uh, after that, it took maybe another 10 years uh, in, until 1997 to recollect again another organization. So we had, um, we had an hiatus moment, if I may call it, for about 17 years of comrades trying to talk themselves to try and reconvene again. And when the when such a crackdown happens, the 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 morale of the masses is also affected because now we were meant to liberate the people, but uh, I have lost my mama, I have lost my father, I have lost you know. So it 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 it, it throws the process of advancing the revolution. So um, I will I will only encourage that every time we make a revolutionary step. We take the interest of the the revolutionaries and the interest of the masses, and let us not do adventurist things. Let us try to understand and master Marxist and Leninist as a guide to science, and let us not learn by rote to try and experiment things to put the revolutionary forces in grave danger if there's no chances of success. And um, it, sometimes there is. Um, especially on the young comrades, there's an over-enthusiasm. There is a rally call, there is sloganeering, I'm the masses now. We have to defeat the bourgeoisie, you know. But we have to go fundamentally that the, the subjective conditions of the revolution has to be there for a revolution to take place. In fact, Mao actually tells us that if an egg do not have, first of all, you have to have an egg with the internal conditions, then you'll have a mm -hmm. chicken. And you have external conditions, the warmth, then the head will, the egg will break into a chicken. Mm -hmm. But now, our country, we say the objective conditions of the revolutions are there. The objective conditions have been created by the, you know, the, the effects of capitalism. We have a mass unemployment. We have people dying of curable diseases. We have um, uh, the, the rich are burning money in consumerism, driving expensive cars. They are um, laundering the economy. People can see that. They are annoyed about it. But is it the time to call for an all-out attack on the bourgeoisie and the establishment? They, they, they have formed alliances with the imperialist uh, entities, and they are willing to crush anybody that tries to challenge their hegemony. So what then does Lenin tell us to do is that we must continue to build the subjective factors on the revolution and help the revolutionaries to organize both overtly and covertly mm -hmm. to challenge the system. And we must be able also to listen and take them, you know, when there is an insurrection in the country, we must be the first people to drive it from a civil war to a revolutionary war. But remember, at any given time, if revolutionaries are not organizing, in the United States, for example, you see the most militant, uh, you know, street protests that we see, the Black Lives Movement. We study it with a lot of care. But if you look at it, as long as they are advancing, but there is no vanguard party to direct it to become a revolutionary war. They, they, they well, will think Go ahead. I, I've been thinking the same thing. They've been doing the same thing since 2014, and they haven't won an inch and unfortunately i think it's because they don't understand 
how the police and the state function. They just are looking at it from the 1960 dreams and saying, oh, in the 1960s, they protested a lot and got some concessions. And unfortunately, we're not in that year. So thing, the, I'll let you talk more about that. <laughs> tell, tell us what you think of your opinion of the Black Lives Matter movement in America. Yeah. What, what I think is that they have um, the Black Lives Matter. Uh, I, uh, I see some similarities with some organizations also in Africa that are either fighting for, um, let us say they're saying anti-corruption movements here, but they, they are under the illusion that you can defeat racism under capitalism. You know, you can defeat corruption under capitalism. Actually, capitalism, the mother, the mother is actually the mother of racism is capitalism. The mother of corruption is capitalism. So you cannot, you cannot deal with the children when the mother is still bearing children. You know, you have to strangulate the mother first. So um, I, I think then the best way to interpret them from the dialectic side is to look at the, uh, the, Mao's, the Mao law of contradiction. Contradiction is a sense that the revolutionaries must be able to analyze the tertiary, the secondary, and the primary contradictions, and then resolve them in the order of priority. So if you take race, for example, as a primary contradiction, and you organize around race, then the, the, the primary contradiction, which is class, is left behind. So you cannot solve a race contradiction in, in the sense that it is a, is a, is a secondary contradiction to the primary contradiction. And sometimes it's even tertiary contradiction, depending on the stage of the struggle. Uh, if you come to my country, for example, where tribalism and ethnicity is, 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 is actually being spinned by the current political leaders, and they want to set not just uh, in, in now in the United States, it will be one race against the other. In my country, it's one ethnicity against the other. They, our political program, our propaganda should be able to inspire the masses in the sense that we bring them back to the contradiction that the in our country, the, 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 the small nationalities or the small tribes, they are actually the same, but there is a class element in each society that continue to auction them on a daily basis. They are, uh, you know, black sellouts like uh, that horrible man called Barack Obama. Oh my who, God. <laughs> He's kind of, oh yeah, I forgot. <laughs> I forgot that he, you know, his dad was from Kenya. Um, yeah, but so, yeah, he, you know, when you, you see, he, there was a lot of emotions when he was the president. You know, the, the black communities were crying and there were a lot of videos being played about the, the Martin Luther King talking about the time for climbing the mountaintop. And, oh uh, people, and that's how propaganda works. And the next time you see Mr. and Mrs. Obama hanging around, uh, you know, kissing Bush and <laughs> Mrs. Bush. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, the people that their hands are full of blood, the, you know, innocent blood of the people. So without, um, because the first contradiction, especially in development of uh, a party, um, which I think Lenin clearly says on what is to be done, is that um, when you come, when, when you are starting a party like the Communist Party of Kenya, when we were starting it, the primary, the primacy, of theory is very important because it is the guide for action. So you cannot turn the, the, the again, now the, the law of opposites also tells us that the primacy of theory becomes secondary when theory takes ground. But now people want to say, no, 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 wait a minute. Maybe Lenin says that any practical revolutionary, uh, you know, effort is much better than a thousand books. But mm -hmm. remember he's saying, revolutionary literature, revolutionary effort, not each and every effort you put across. So uh, the revolutionary should be able to understand contradictions in building the party and contradictions in mass organizing. And that is the importance of um, ideological school to be able to equip revolutionaries with the science 
of the proletariat revolution. Like, um, it is better to start three people. Like, I think the Communist Party of Kenya, it started the conversations of around people to make a clarity of thought of where we want to go. And then after that, then we have to take the second step. So from theory to practice, practice to theory, theory informs practice, practice informs theory, theory enriches practice, practice enriches theory. But you cannot take, you know, uh, some people say, let's be pragmatic, but they don't try to debunk what they're calling pragmatism because pro pragmatism, basically they want you to act without, you know, in knowledge. Acquiesce to that. the bourgeoisie. <laughs> Basically, that's what pragmatism is code for. Yeah. So when I talk about uh, such struggles, I saw some militancy, but sometimes I get really offended when I see maybe there's a police person talking to the black right, uh, the black activist, and mm -hmm. then he's trying to talk to them in a very good way. And they're saying, you know, we are part of you. And you find the protesters will pick up the microphone and tell the police, you're very good to us. You're not like oh, the others. But they don't understand that this police is a system. It's a, it's part yes. of the oppressive system of the empire. Yes. And uh, however bad, however good, they are they they are prisoned to serve the the the, the, the hegemons, the warmongers in, in in Washington. So until they understand that, it can only be like Lenin will tell us, riots will be there governments will fall, but without a vanguard political party, without um, uh, revolutionaries, there will be no revolution. Mm -mm. Look at, um, I think when um, Egypt uh, uprising, what they but were that was a fake one created by the state of National Endowment for Democracy, the Tari Square, right? That was a coup. That was a color revolution. In fact, I was very angry to see in the streets, you know, they had... Um, they were, they were calling... angry people, but then what happened is in the middle came the uh, color revolution people and just stole it. In fact, at that time when the Egypt, the so-called Egyptian revolution was happening, because it wasn't, I, uh, they used to, they, there were people were calling it Facebook revolution. So there were people <laughs> working with Facebook chats. And um, there are a lot of American nationals. I've never seen so much in, in Egypt there. We were wondering, what are they doing there? <laughs> then primarily, but there are certain lessons that we took there because we realized that even though the government of Hosni Bobarak fell mm -hmm. and the, the most organized will take power, whether that most organized is revolutionary or reactionary. So yeah. that is why we landed into a theocracy, Muslim Brotherhood, because they were the most organized at that time. But then so they had a coup against him and we get Sisi. Yeah, so if we, uh, the, the, the thing is that the revolutionaries must always prepare and study the movements within the working class and try to direct it. And the idea is to organize daily for an alternative people's power away from the state. Because the, 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 the objective factors of the revolution, I can tell you in our country, with a country with 60% unemployment, what is there to celebrate about? With a country like in Kenya, we have 70% 70, 70 could be exaggerated if you're talking about perfect slum areas. But in the poor neighborhoods, uh, there are people living in polythene bags. About 40% of the population do not have running water. They do not have proper healthcare systems. They are dying of curable diseases. We can see the rich politicians are flying their loved ones out to seek for good medical health care. We see uh, people stealing money for cancer centers. And when they get cancer, they take the next flight to go to you know, to seek treatment from abroad. So uh, there is a lot for us to organize, but if we focus on only the objective factors and we don't come back, which I think is the biggest thing because it's the, it's the most important task. Um, and that also brings me to Cuba, you know, keep, keep, keep people talk about uh, the, bio, uh, the medicine progress. Mm -hmm. They speak about sports progress. But they don't talk about the project of creating a new human being that yeah. people are to themselves. They don't talk about, you know, the, uh, the easy well, conversation. You, you know what? It's kind of funny because Fidel Castro actually said that 
the reason why Che is special is because of capitalism. And we want to like if Cuba succeeds, every citizen of ours will be a Che Guevara. Um, That was very inspiring for me. And yeah, but basically you're right. Um, Go ahead. (laughs) Yeah. And and um, you could see the um, typically now that you mentioned Che Guevara, the imperialist countries wanted to they, they, they tried to. It's only Che that I think we have continued to consistently maintain his legacy and his revolutionary credentials. But normally when the revolutionaries die, they want to canonize them and yeah. then dilute their revolutionary credentials and say that, um, you know, now we can have a foundation with their name. Look like, at what uh, they're doing to, to Salvador Mandela. Allende. Yes, yeah, Salvador Allende and uh, even in Africa, they talk about, ah, Thomas Sankara was a good person. Oh, yes. To talk about his communist credential, Abelka Cabran was a good person. He loved his people. They want to make it only a flip, uh, you know, a lip service. Yes. So, um, if you look at your struggles in India, for example, nobody oh, talk wow. about the thing, you know. They, but at least there's a new hope in India. Uh, I talk with comrades from Kerala. You know, yeah. Say, Kerala is the only state in India. The others are, um, you know. Uh, just an appendage of the of the Western imperialism. And yeah, well, there, uh, yeah. I, I mean, uh, the Communist Party is coming along well and much better than it ever has to like oppose the fascism, I guess. But yeah. things are hard. <laughs> I, think, I think also uh, when you elect an extreme uh, right wing uh, fundamentalist like Modi, uh, he brings new contradictions within the system. So exactly. It's not yeah, so uh, that could be uh, also good for us because, and then you talked about something very interesting, which was concessions, because uh, the ruling class are willing to concede if there is a real threat for their falling. Um, and, 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 and they do it for a time. So if, if they realize that the Black Lives Matter movement is going to threaten the system stability, they could win some concession only for a while. And, and that is even clear in the factory unionism and economism advancement. If, if, if you really put more pressure, then you are sure you're going to go to that bargaining table and you're going to get a few things for the workers. But we should be, as revolutionaries, always know that we, we can win a few reforms within mm-hmm. the capitalist system, but in actual sense, we will not change the system within the capitalist system. We have to... Uh, uh, wage a political struggle. Another ideological question that um, uh, uh, probably we could talk about on that document in um, dialectics is people say that if you say that the, and and, and this is very, uh, sometimes very irritating because they say, Booker, you are talking about economy as the substructure of the, you're talking about the economy is the foundation. And then you're talking about all, 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 all other things you know, at the superstructure. Then they come and tell you, why don't we get economic power first? Then- <laughs> That's yeah. because it's like a building. You can't just go in and hide in the basement first and hope that the landlords don't evict you. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. and uh, I, I asked them, you can only fight with what you have. You know, yes. the working class don't have money. If you and if you try to get money, they will use the same weapons to cash you. So we must take what we can get, which is the political power, and then use the political power to expropriate the expropriators and then destroy the bourgeoisie arrangement and start building. You know, I like the saying from Karl Marx that the the last capitalist will hang is the one who sold us the (laughs) rope. I don't think he said it like they, if no one knows who said it, but that was that's a that's a very popular uh, retort. Um, so thank you. <laughs> so, what time is it Ed, right over there? It's 15 minutes after midnight. OK, well, in that case, I won't keep you up much longer. Thank you so much. And is there a website or a Facebook page, Twitter, anything else that people can follow you on? 
Yes, we the Communist Party of Kenya is um, is on all social media, but we have a very proactive website, especially if you want to go through our party documents, you want to study some of the press releases that we have done. We are at communistpartyofkenya.org. Okay. So you can you can have a look, but then we have a very active uh, Twitter account that we use to break news, especially in organizing, and that is the Communists KE. And um, there are all other social media platforms. We just check Communist Party of Kenya. Okay. As the all our party leadership also have social handles because we are trying to reach as much young people as possible. What, one quick question: to, um, the election is in August. Yes, um, we have a big event coming up on May 4th, we, mm-hmm. uh, May 14th. You know, we did release the, um, a small video of the rap music and then it went viral and we had not, uh, we had planned to release the full video on May 14th uh-huh. when I will be launching my campaigns to August 9th. Okay, so, um, August 9th. And um are there any like are people in Kenya automatically registered or do they have to register to vote or how does it work? Uh, just like any other capitalist system, make it complicated for the people to access it. So that means so they have to have register to, to vote. Yes. I do, what's the deadline so for that? The, yeah. So the, the registration of voters is going on. The mass voter registration has just ended um, on the 6th, which was yesterday. And um, I think after, again, uh, three months, again, they will open the register for a few more days for us to open. Um, okay. but they, we got, we will say for the first time, we have real opportunities because of the amount of support we have gotten from the, the Kenyan masses and solidarity from people like you and uh, uh, progressives. So we have certain real chances of winning elections. But even having said that, we must know the limitations of the bourgeois elections. Yep. We are not here to say that we will save the Kenyan masses through uh, bourgeois democracy. No, it is only one uh, you know, way to conduct our propaganda. And also during that time, the masses are uh, politically activated. So we cannot abandon the masses to only reactionary ideas. Exactly. But we don't. We don't see bourgeois elections as the alpha and omega. We don't see them as the what we will uh, help us defeat the repressive system you know, that uh, is being led by the puppet government of the day. Now, no, we will participate in the bourgeois elections, and uh, for us, organize organization wise, it will be permanent, whether after elections or before elections. Elections is just an event for us. And once you're done with it, the organization, we will intensify with our new realities. Well, thank you very much for coming along. Um, I can't wait. It was amazing to have somebody so knowledgeable in theory and everything. And have a wonderful night. I'm sorry we kept you so late. It was wonderful. No, and I'm also sorry, you know, we, we, my, my comms team was talking to you people on Twitter. And then we had another interview that um, yeah. was with the Morningstar in, for Britain. Oh, and then, Morningstar, they're good. Um, they were live, right? Yeah. yeah, so we, I had to finish that and then come back to you. But that's not our, it was unplanned for. So I wasn't um, going to to say that um, I'm not going to take an interview with you. No, we would like to have our ideas out there. And the uh, one hour and a half delay was something uncalled for for us. We will plan better uh, next time to meet your expectations. Please don't, don't oh, worry no, was, about that. It don't was, worry about it. it we're, you know, it was just, it, it's fine. It, it happens often. Um, we're very thank accommodating, you. so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have a good yeah. night then. And, um, Oh, how do you say, what is the greeting in Kenya that you're, is there a greeting that uh, people do? Like in India, we do namaste. Like, what, what, what do we say in Kenya? Uh, many times you just say jambo. Jambo. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good greeting. Yeah. Okay, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, 
So we actually recorded uh, Asha um, reading 1938 Stalin's uh, Dialectical and Historical Materialism, but we only got to about half of it. So I'm going to play that now, and I'm sorry there's going to be a short stop on the end of it. Um, and Asha is not going to be coming back tonight. So if you have any questions or anything, just um, leave them for next week. Thank you. Hold on. Dialectical materialism is the world outlook of the Marxist-Leninist party. It is called dialectical. Sorry, give me one second. I Dialectical materialism is the world outlook of the Marxist-Leninist party. It is called dialectical materialism because its approach to the phenomenon of nature and its method of studying and apprehending them is dialectical, while its interpretation of the phenomenon of nature, its conception of these phenomena, its theory is materialistic. Historical materialism is the extension of the principles of dialectical materialism to the study of social life and application of the principles of dialectical materialism to the phenomena of its life of society, to study of society, to the study of society and of its history. When describing their dialectical method, Marx and Engels usually refer to Hegel as the philosopher who formulated the main features of dialectics. However, this does not mean the dialectics of Marx and Engels is identical with the dialectics of Hegel. As a matter of fact, Marx and Engels took from the Hegelian dialectics only its rational kernel, casting aside its Hegelian idealistic shell and developed dialectics further so as to lend it a modern scientific form. My dialectical method, says Marx, is not only different from the Hegelian, but it is direct opposite. To Hegel, the process of thinking, which under the name of the idea, I can never say ideas without thinking of Dave Rubin. <laughs> Sorry. Um, he even transforms it into an independent subject is, and is the de Moyer cause creator of the real world and the real world is only the external phenomenal form of the idea. With me, on the contrary, the ideal is nothing else than the material world reflected by the human mind and translated it into forms of thought. Marx, afterward to the second German edition of volume one of Kapital, Das Kapital. When describing their materialism, Marx and Engels usually refer to Feuerbach, which Fokker mentioned, as the philosopher who restored materialism to its rights. This, however, does not mean the materialism of Marx and Engels is identical with that of Feuerbach. Um, okay, I kind of, it's fine. <laughs> In fact, Marx and Engels took from Feuerbach's materialism its inner kernel and developed it into a scientific philosophical theory of materialism and cast aside its idealistic and religious ethical encumbrances. We know that Feuerbach, although he was fundamentally a materialist, objected to the name materialism. Engels more than once declared that in spite of the materialist foundation, Feuerbach remained bound by the traditional idealist fetters, and that real idealism of Feuerbach becomes evident as soon as we come to his philosophy of religion and ethics. Dialectics comes from the Greek dialogo, 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 I don't know how to pronounce it, okay, to discourse, to debate. 
in ancient times, dialectics was the art at arriving at the truth by disclosing contradictions in the argument of an opponent and overcoming these contradictions. Um, like, oh yeah, Anarch always loves to pretend that, um, yeah, uh, he doesn't, he, Janet, you remember, you know, but like Anarch and pretending he doesn't under, he, he's like, he, he always says, I don't understand dialect. Oh, I know he doesn't, but it's like, he, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm okay, I was just, I, I was, he, this just reminded me of an Anark tweet where he pretended, well, okay, I guess he does not, I know, okay, he does not understand dialectical materialism, no. but that has nothing to do with people not being able to explain it properly to him, but him like wanting not to understand. Yeah, he doesn't want to take the time to listen to anybody else on it because he just has, decided in his head that dialectical materialism is bullshit mm -hmm. not and this is i'm an anarchist so or yeah yeah I, but you're not named a narc <laughs> yeah i mean you're an anarchist but like yours you study dialectics right i do i study it and and i think it's extremely important to actually understand all this stuff in this way and i don't i mean i don't you know, I don't really label myself anarchist and communist or something, but I think I think it's very, very important to uh, be able to to be able to pull this stuff out and, and like like now with what I've learned even in this last year and I, I knew some of it before, but what I've learned in this last year being on the show was was that you know I can now like look at something and I can like debunk it like almost immediately because of mm -hmm. using these using that and that's very important it, when you're living under such propaganda yes correct um there were okay i forgot okay um there were philosophers in ancient times who believed that the disclosure of contradictions in thought and the clash of opposite opinions was the best method of arriving at the truth this dialectical method of thought later extended to the phenomena of nature and developed into the dialectic method of apprehending nature, which regards the phenomenon of nature as being in constant movement and undergoing constant change, and the development of nature as a result of the development of contradictions in nature as the result of the interaction of opposite forces in nature. In essence, Dialectics is the direct opposite of metaphysics. The principal features of Marxist dialectical method are as follows. Nature is connected and determined. Contrary to metaphysics, dialectics does not regard nature as an accidental agglomeration of things, a phenomenon unconnected with isolated form, independent of each other, but as a connected integral whole in which things Phenomenon are organically connected with and dependent upon and determined by each other. The dialectical method therefore holds that no phenomenon in nature can be understood if taken by itself, isolated from the surrounding phenomenon, in as much as any phenomenon in any realm of nature may become meaningless to us if it is not considered in connection with the surrounding connections, but divorced from them. That vice versa, any phenomenon can be understood and explained if it is con in its inseparable condition with the surrounding phenomenon as one conditioned by the surrounding phenomenon. Nature is, it, oh, and this is kind of how I know when like the, like basically for, you know how everything is connected and uh, everything happens for, uh, nothing happens by accident. Like, that's like how I always know when they're like hiding something in history for me to just like go look through because you'll see something like uh, I don't know, the Zimmerman telegram and then it, it caused World War One and you're like, caused US to, and you're like, that does not make sense. Hmm. And then you look through and it's like, oh, the US has been secretly negotiating with Britain. In just because they kind of knew that the Tsarist Russia was unstable and they might need to come in. Ah, ah, 
so that's how this has how I often am aware of like when they're like hiding something in history. Contrary to metaphysics, dialectical dialectics hold that the nature is not a state of rest and immutability, stagnation and immutability, but a state of continuous movement and change of continuous renewal and development where something is always arising and developing and something is always disintegrating and dying away. Dialectical method therefore requires that the phenomenon be, should be considered not only from the standpoint of their interconnection and interdependence, but also from the standpoint of their movement, their change, their development, their coming into being and their going out of being. Yep. The dialectical method regards as important primarily not that which at a given moment seems to be durable and yet is already beginning to die away, but that which is arising and developing, even though for a given moment, it may not appear to be durable. For the dialectical method considers invincible only that which is arising and developing. All nature, says Engels, from the smallest to the biggest, from grains of sand to suns and from protista, primary uh, living cells, according to Stalin, to man has its existence in eternal coming into being and going out of being in a ceaseless flux in unresting motion and change. Therefore, dialectics, Engel says, takes things from their perceptual images, essentially in their interconnection and in their concatenation, in their movement, in their rise and their disappearance. See, nature, natural quantitative change leads to qualitative change. We're, oh, okay, um, hold on. Contrary to metaphysics, dialectics does not regard the process of development as a simple process of growth, where quantitative changes do not lead to qualitative changes, but as a development which passes from insignificant and imperceptible, imperse, imperce, ah, imperceptible, not perceivable, <laughs> quantitative changes to open fundamental changes to qualitative changes, a, de a development in which the qualitative changes does not occur gradually, but rapidly and abruptly taking form of a leap from one state to another. They do not occur accidentally, but as a natural re result of an accumulation of im not perceivable and gradual quantitative changes. Kind of like ice melting with water. No, no, no. Like if you like lower the temperature, you can never actually quite tell when it becomes ice, but suddenly you end up with a block of ice, but that's because you're lowering the temperature of the water. Okay, that's the uh, example. I think that, yeah, um, I think that's the example that Stalin gives, in fact. Okay, <laughs> yes, that is actually the example that Stalin gives. <laughs> okay, I should have given a different example. Oh, well. <laughs> the dialectical method hold, therefore holds that the process of development should not be, should not be understood as movement in a circle, not as a simple repetition of what has already occurred, but an onward upward movement as a transition from an old qualitative state to a new qualitative state, from the development from the simple to the complex, from lower to higher. Although it seems a little circular sometimes, <laughs> don't you think, Christiana? Yeah, yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nature, says Engels, is a test of dialectics, and it must be said for modern natural science that it has furnished extremely rich and daily increasing materials for this test, the, and has thus proved that in the last analysis, nature's process is dialectical and not metaphysical. Yep, clearly, it's not like somebody can think it and it becomes a reality. That's Harry Potter. That does not move in an eternally uniform and constantly repeated circle, but passes through real history. Here, prime mention should be made of Darwin, who dealt a severe bl blow to the metaphysical conception of nature by proving that the organic world of today, plants and animals, and consequently man too, is all a product of a process of development that has been pro in progress for a million years. What year was this written? 1938. 38. 
Do you remember when they did the Scopes Monkey Trial in America? Oh, I think that might have been. Hold on. Okay, I just want to see because like a lot of like Americans were like uh, I don't know we're making fun of Lisa. That was Lisa. twenty-five, so that was yeah, that was about... not too far apart. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I just wanted to kind of remind people of that. Okay. Mm. Did we finish net? Oh, what section are we on? Uh, I forgot. Ah, in describing the dialectical development as a transition from quantitative change to qualitative changes, Engel says, in physics, every change is a passing of a quantity into quality as a result of a quantitative change in some form of movement, either inherent in a body or imparted to it. <laughs> Okay. For example, the temperature of water ha has at first no effect in on its liquid state. But as the temperature of the liquid water rises or falls, a moment arrives when the state of cohesion changes and the water is converted in one case into steam and the other into ice. A definite minimum current is required to make a platinum wire glow. Every metal has its melting temperature. Every liquid has a definite freezing point and a boiling point at a given pressure. As far as we are able with the means at our disposal to attain the required temperatures, finally, every gas has its critical point by proper pressure and cooling, which can be converted into a liquid state, what are known as constants of physics, the point at which one state passes into another. Stalin, that's another, um, I guess, annotation. <laughs> are in most cases, nothing but designations for nodal points at which a quantitative change, increase or decrease of movement causes a qualitative change in the state of a given body at which consequently quantity is transformed into quality. Passing to chemistry, Engels continue. Oh, wow, Booker was very thorough. <laughs> His explanation, okay. Passing to chemistry, Ingalls continues, chemistry may be the science of qualitative changes which takes place in bodies as the effect of changes in quantitative composition. This was already known to Hegel. Take oxygen. If the molecule contains three atoms instead of a customary two, we get ozone. A body definitely distinct in odor and reaction from the ordinary oxygen. But at what shall we say of the different proportions in which oxygen combines with nitrogen or sulfur and each which produces a body qualitatively different than all the other body. Finally, criticizing Deering, who scolded Hegel for all he was worth, but so repetitiously borrowed from him the well-known thesis that the transition from the insentient world to the sentient world, from the kingdom of inorganic matter to the kingdom of organic life is a leap to a new state, Engel says, this is precisely the Hegelian nodal line of measure relations in which a certain definite nodal point, the purely quantitative increase or the decrease gives rise to the qualitative leap. For example, the case of cool water, which is heated or cooled, where boiling point and freezing point are nodes at which under normal pressure, the leap to a new aggregate state takes place where the consequently the quantity is transformed into quality. D, contradictions inherent in nature. Contrary to metaphysics, dialectics holds that all internal contradictions are inherent in all things and phenomenon of nature for they have their positive sides and the negative sides, a past, a future, something dying away and something developing, a struggle between opposites, a struggle between the old and the new, between that which is dying away and that which is being born, between that which is disappearing and that which is developing, constitutes the internal content of the process of development, the internal content of the transformation of qualitative, of quantitative changes to qualitative changes. The dialectic method therefore holds that the process of development from lower to higher form takes place, but not as a harmon harmonious unfolding phenomenon, but as a disclosure of these internal contradictions inherent in things. Phenomenon as a struggle of opposite tendencies which operate on the basis of these contradictions like the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. Um, in the proper meaning, Lenin says, dialectics is the study of the contradiction within the very essence of things, Lenin's Philosophical Notebooks, page 265. And development 
of the struggle of opposites. Such in brief are the principal features of the Marxist dialectical method. It is easy to understand how immensely important is the extension of the principles of the dialectical method to the study of social life and the history of society and how immensely important is the application of these principles to the history of society and to the practical activities of the party of the proletariat. There are no isolated phenomena in the world. If all the phenomena are interconnected and interdependent, then it is clear that every social system and every social movement in history must have must be evaluated from a not from the standpoint of eternal justice or from other preconceived idea, as it is not infrequently done by historians, <clears throat> but from the standpoint of conditions which give rise to the system or that social movement and with which they are connected. A slave system would be senseless, stupid, and unnatural under modern, modern conditions. But under conditions of a disintegrating primitive communal system, the say that is quite understandable and the natural phenomenon since it represents an advance on the primitive communal system. Actually, um, I'm really, I'm really, actually, it's really weird. I'm reading this book from a British dude who, who's, who wrote this like travel journal called on Russia and I expected it to be racist, but it was not. I, it, it's like amazing how not racist he is for being British. It's called Russia by Donald McKenzie, but he actually explains serfdom in a very dialectical way. So in a country like Russia, basically uh, you, uh, the land is utterly worthless. Like it can't produce anything unless you have people working on the land. So then in order to make the land, the, the land, like if you tell a noble somebody, oh, I'm going to give you land, you just have an utterly worthless hunk of land. But if you says I have a land with like 100 people working on it, that actually translates into money. So that's how like serfdom developed. Um, uh, yeah, and this is from like a not racist British guy who's not, who was, was a liberal from the 1800s, I guess. Uh, Although he was, he, I don't know what his, he might have been a liberal, but he was, he is dialectical in his, and his thorough, his study of Tsarist Russia is very thorough. Like, I like it. So anyways, um, yeah, I am, but I, I, where did I leave off? Slave system. Okay. The demand for a bourgeoisie democratic republic when the when Tsardom and the bourgeoisie society existed as let's say in 1905 was quite understandable and proper revolutionary demand. For at that time a bourgeoisie republic would have meant a step forward. But now under the conditions of the USSR a demand for the bourgeoisie republic would be senseless and counter-revolutionary for a bourgeoisie would be a retrograde step <laughs> compared with the Soviet republics. <laughs> okay, sorry. Every day on the conditions, time and place. Sorry, everything depends on the conditions, time and place. It is clear that without such a historical approach to social phenomenon, the existence and development of the science of history is impossible. For such an approach saves the history of science becoming from becoming a jumble of accidents and agglomeration of the most absurd mistakes. Like, oh my God, the US blundered into war and accidentally said um, Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, capitalists try to pretend that history is just an agglomeration of absurd mistakes. That's not true. <laughs> Further, if the world is in a state of constant movement and development, and if the dying of the old and the upgrowth of the new is law of development, then it is clear that there can be no immutable social systems, no eternal principles of private property and exploitation, and no eternal ideas of the subjugation of the peasant to the landlord, of the worker to the capitalist. Hence, the capitalist system can be replaced by the socialist system, just as at one point the feudal system was replaced by the capitalist system. Hence, we must not base our orientation on the strata of society which are no longer developing, even though they constitute a, 
even though they at present constitute the predominant force, but those but, but on those strata which are developing and have a future before them, even though they at present do not constitute the predominant force. At this time, I'd like to say um, first world people versus third world people. First world people maybe may make up a billion, third world people make up six billion. So at the present time, while the people in the first world may be the predominant force, they are, uh, they are um, wasting away. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Janet, cut this if this is overly inflammatory. No, you're, you're fine. Okay, in the 80s of the past century, as in, in the 1880s, two past centuries, in the period of the struggle between the Marxists and the Narodniks, the proletariats in Russia constituted an insignificant minority of the population, whereas the individual peasant constituted the vast majority of the population. But the proletariat was developing as a class, whereas peasantry as a class was disintegrating. And because the proletariat was developing as a class and Marxists based their orientation on the proletariat, and they were not mistaken for, as we know, the proletariat subsequently grew from an insignificant force into a first rate historical and political force that now numbers in over billions and billions and billions of people. Hence, in order not to err in policy, one must look forward and not backward. <laughs> Further, if passing of the slow quantitative changes into rapid and abrupt qualitative changes is a law of development, then it is clear that the revolution made by the oppressed class are quite natural and inevitable because the oppress because of capitalism uh, naturally wants to turn things into cartels and monopolies. So uh, what happens is that more and more crap is going to be controlled by fewer and fewer people. And at one point, you'll be like four people against to eight billion and or whatever. And yeah, it's easy for four people, eight billion to like kind of throw off four people <laughs> in theory, eventually, if we last that long, unless like climate change, uh, whatever. Okay. Hence the transition from capitalism to socialism and the liberation of the working class from the yoke of capitalism cannot be affected by slow changes and by slow reforms, but only on the qualitative change of the capitalist system by revolution. Hence, in order not to err in policy, one must be revolutionary and not reform. Oh my God, Booker is very thorough. He's like had this thing memorized or something. <laughs> right? Very, very good. Yeah. He had to have this. I, I swear to God, he had this. He has this whole thing memorized. Otherwise, like, you think he had it memorized? I mean, he just know he knows the stuff really well, so he was really good on it. Yeah, because he he's gone through everything here. <laughs> wow. Okay. If. Further, if developments proceeds by the way of disclosure of internal contradictions, by way of collisions of opposite forces and on the basis of these contradictions, so as to overcome these contradictions, then it is clear that class struggle of the proletariat is a quite natural and inevitable phenomenon. Okay, Avenirus's brain, uh, okay, he calls, um, it's really funny, like Lenin talk in, in his materials and thing talks about the brain and Avenirius apparently like says that the thought is separate from the brain. So he calls, uh, Lenin calls uh, idealism a brainless philosophy. <laughs> Sorry. That's, a, that's what I miss about Lenin. <laughs> Don't you? Yes, we, we love Lenin's sarcasm in, in little quips. <laughs> Yeah, Stalin does not do anything like that. So he's like very straight laced. So yeah. Um, so at this point, he would have like Lenin would have called uh, somebody would have had, but that's what makes Lenin less clear than Stalin because he takes all this like quips and sarcasm and and insults. <laughs> all right. Okay. If development proceeds by the way of disclosure of internal contradictions by way of collisions between opposite forces on the basis of these contradictions so as to overcome these contradictions, then it is clear that the class struggle of the proletariat is quite natural and inevitable phenomenon. 
but we must not cover up the contradictions of the capitalist system, but disclose and unravel them. We must not try to check the class struggle, but carry it to its conclusion. Hence, in order not to err in policy, one must pursue an uncompromising pro proletariat class policy, not a reformist policy of harmony of interests of the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, not a compromise policy of the growing of capitalism into socialism. Such is the Marxist dialectical method when applied to social life and to the history of society. As to Marxist philosophical materialism, it is the fundamentally the direct opposite of philosophical idealism. Okay, I can handle this. Oh, and Stalin has no, usually do, does not have any footnotes. Okay, I didn't know that, okay. He writes like, like much cleaner than Lenin. Okay, I did not know that. Sorry. <laughs> Where are we now? Uh, ah. A principal feature of Marxist philosophical materialism is as follows. A, materialist. Contrary to idealism, which regards the world as an embodiment of an absolute idea, a universal spirit, consciousness, Marxist philosophical materialism holds that the world is by its very nature material and that the multifold of phenomenon of the world constitute different forms of matter in motion, that interconnection and interdependence of phenomenon as established by the dialectical method are a law of development of moving matter. That the world develops in accordance with laws of movement and matter and stands in no need of a universal spirit. The materialist outlook on nature, says Engels, means no more than simply conceiving nature as it exists without any foreign admixture. Speaking of the material views of the ancient philosopher Herac it's Heraclitus, that's it. Heraclitus. Heraclitus, okay. Who held the world, the all in one, was not created by any god or any man, but was, is, and ever will be a living flame systematically flaring up and systematically dying down. Lenin comments, a very good exposition on the rudiments of dialectical materialism. Contrary to idealism, which asserts that our consciousness really exists and that the material world being nature exists only in our consciousness, in our sensations and ideas and perceptions, the Marxist philosophical materialism holds that nature being is an objective reality existing outside the independent and independent of our consciousness, that matter is primary since it is a source of sensations, idea, and consciousness, and that consciousness is secondary, derivative uh, since it is a reflection of matter, a reflection of being. That thought is a product of matter in which its development has reached a high degree of perfection, namely of the brain, and that the brain is an organ of thought, and that therefore one cannot substitute and therefore, one cannot separate thought from matter without committing a grave error, says Engels. Yeah, so anytime, like anytime an incels discuss ideas, that's what they're doing. Okay. The question of the relation of thinking to the being, the relation of the spirit to nature, is the paramount question of the whole of philosophy. The answers which the philosophers gave to this question split them into two camps. Those who asserted the primacy of spirit to nature comp comprise the camp of idealism. The others who regard nature as primary belong to the various schools of materialism. And the material sensuously, by sensuously, he means through your senses, of course, um, not, not, not some other way. Uh, uh, <laughs> Engels, <laughs> perceptible world to which we ourselves belong is the only reality. Our consciousness and thinking, however, is suprasensuous, as in they may seem are a product of a material bodily organ, the brain. Matter is not a product of mind, but mind itself is merely the highest product of matter. Concerning the question of matter and thought, it is impossible to separate thought from matter that thinks. Matter is the subject of all changes. Describing Marxist philosophical materialism, Lenin says, materialism in general recognizes objectively real being matter as independent of consciousness, sensation, experience. Consciousness is only the reflection of being at best and approximately true, adequate, 
perfectly exact reflection of it. Lenin's Imperial Materialism, Lenin Collected Works, Volume 8, page 266, the Russian edition, of course. And further, a matter that which is acting upon our sense organs produces sensations. Matter is the objective reality given to us in sensation. Matter, nature being, being the physical is primary, spirit, consciousness, and sensation, the psychical is secondary, again, Lenin. The world picture is a picture of how matter moves and how matter thinks. The brain is an organ of thought for everyone except for <laughs> Trotsky. I know who you're going to say. <laughs> there's actually what? A few. I know who you're going to say, but there's actually a few of them. So... Oh, really? Um, that the brain is a matter of thought and that you said except for, yeah. I'm pretty sure yeah. <laughs> that's who you're going to say. <laughs> yes, I, would, I changed my mind. Yeah, except for, but there's a, and I, it's, it's a long list of people. <laughs> okay. And world and its laws, okay, C, the world and its laws are knowable. Contrary to idealism, which denies a possibility of knowing the world and its laws, which does not believe in the authentic, authenticity of our knowledge and does not recognize objective truth that it holds the world is full of things in it themselves that can ne be never known to science. Material Mar Marxist philosophical materialism holds that the world and its laws are fully knowable and that their knowledge of the laws of nature tested by experiment and practice is authentic knowledge and have the validity of objective truth and there are no things in the world which are not which are unknowable, only things which are as of yet not known, but which will be disclosed and made known by the efforts of science and practice. Yeah, um, I agree. Yeah, um, critic and that, and this is actually why I am willing to always spend it. Like whenever I don't understand something, like the magic oh protest is there going to be a revolution in Cuba or whatever. I'm like, hmm. I, that's why I'm like, oh, I can know this. And then I kind of try to go figure out what the, how to figure it, what the answer is um, because I assume that everything is knowable, including like, who's telling the truth? Is the US government lying to you? Of course they are. <laughs> I love Kwame Ture saying, how does it go? What were you saying? Kwame Ture is saying about if the U.S. government tells the oh yeah yeah if the U.S. government tells the truth it's lying twice yeah okay hold on. Cr criticizing the thesis of Kant and other idealists that the world is unknowable and there are things in themselves which are unknowable and that defending the well-known materialist thesis that our knowledge is authentic knowledge. Ingalls writes the most telling refutation of this is all of this as of all other philosophical crotchets. What does that mean? Um, hold on. Crotchet. It is a British word for a perverse and unfounded belief or notion. Ah, okay, I like that, okay. A perverse or unfounded belief or notion. The Democratic Party's platforms is filled with crotchets. I don't know. The most telling refutation of this as of all other philosophical crotchets is practice, namely experiment and industry. If we are able to prove the correctness of our conception of a natural process by making it ourselves, and bringing it into being out of its conditions and making it serve our own purposes into the bargain, then there is an end to the Kantian ungraspable thing in itself. Yeah, he's right. The chemical substances of the bodies of plants and animals remained such things in themselves until organic chemistry began to produce them, in, produce them one after another, whereupon the thing in itself became a thing for us. For instance, alizarin, the coloring, um, the coloring matter. One second, uh, Janet. Uh, 
Alizar in the coloring matter of the matter, huh? Which we no longer trouble to grow, ill the matter roots in the field, but produce much more cheaply and simply from the coal tar. For 300 years, the Copernican solar system was a hypothesis with a hundred and a thousand or 10,000 chances to one in its favor, but it's still always a hypothesis. But when Levi, Le, Lev, Leverrier, by means of the data provided by this system, not only deduced the necessity of the existence of the unknown planet, but also calculated the position in the heavens which this planet must be necessarily occupy. And when Gale really found this planet, the Copernican system was proved. Okay, so, <laughs> but when you're saying uh, the coloring matter of the matter, it's M-A-D-D-E-R, that's actually a plant. Oh, okay. And in American accent, it sounds the same. Okay. Oh my God. Okay. Lenin is a, okay. Lenin super insults these three people and we're not going to, okay. How do we, uh, okay. I'm just going to, okay. So according to accusing Bogdanov, Bazarov and Yushkevich and other followers of Mach, a fighty, a fightism, a reactionary theory which prefers fate to science and defending the well-known materialist thesis that our scientific knowledge of laws and of nature is authentic knowledge and that the laws of science represents ob objective truth, Lenin says, contemporary fightism does not at all reject science. It rejects, all it rejects is the exaggerated claims of science to wit its claims to objective truth. If objective truth exists as a material thinks and if natural science reflecting on the, reflecting the outer world in human experience is alone capable of giving us the objective truth, then all fideism is absolutely refuted. Such in brief are the characteristic features of the Marxist philosophical materialism. It's easy to understand how immensely important it is, is the extension of the principles of philosophical materialism to the study of social life of the history of society and how immensely important is the application of these principles to the history of society and to the practical activities of the party of the proletariat. If the connection between phenomenon of nature and their interdependence are the laws of development of nature, it follows too that the connection and interdependence of the phenomenon of social life are the laws of development are, of society are not something accidental. Hence, social life, the history of society, see this to be an agglomeration of accidents for the history of society becomes the development of society into regular laws and the study of history of society becomes the science. Yeah. Incubator babies. Oh, that was an accident. Believe us this time, Russia and Ukraine are totally, Russia totally wants to invade Ukraine. Oh my God, Ned's box. Like he literally <laughs> said that, right? By the way, um, have you um, uh, the, the guy, uh, the AAP guy, Matt Lee? He actually, uh, when uh, uh, in 2014, when Jen Psaki uh, said that the U.S. has a long-standing policy of not interfering in Latin America, he's the same one who said, "Wait, wait, 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 how long-standing?" <laughs> Anyways, sorry. I forgot where we were. Uh, where we are. Hence, the practical activity of the party of the proletariat must not be based on good wishes of outstanding individuals and not the dictates of reason and morals, but on the laws of development of society and on the study of these laws. Further, if the world is knowable and our knowledge of the laws of development of nature is authentic knowledge, Having the validity of objective truth, it follows that social life, the development of society is also knowable and that the data of science regarding the laws of development of society are authentic data having the validity of objective truths. I don't understand. What, okay, for if the world is knowable and our knowledge of the laws of development is authentic, then it, and since, society comes from nature the laws of data of science regarding the how societies develop is also yeah 
That makes sense. Okay. The science of history of society, despite all the complexity of phenomenon of social life, can become as precise as science, let's say biology, capable of making use the laws of development of society for practical purposes. Yep. Thank you.